So, as I was saying, hello ah, everybody. Sorry, I have to introduce you. This is Dottie, and <laughs> this is his talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I work in the, uh, the, tool ch the platform tool chain team at Red Hat. And um, so this talk is going to be um, about you know, dis discussing with, uh, with um, you guys um, about the, the new kinds of uh, debug info formats that are um, coming, in the, that we're seeing coming um, in the kernel space. And, um, and tell you guys about how we're using the existing debug info uh, infrastructure that is there already to perform some uh, um, analysis of, uh, um, 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 well, I, I was told not to, to talk about kernel ABI, uh, so I will talk about kernel module interface. Um, so the idea is to, to, to show quickly what we do with the debug info today, um, and so that we, can, we know what, to, uh, what, we, what would be nice um, to expect from, uh, from the new uh, de you know, debug info formats that are coming so that we can keep doing what we're doing today um, and, and, and even getting better, um, you know, better experience. So first of all, why are we interested in, uh, analysis, you know, in, in looking at um, the kernel module interface uh, from a binary standpoint? So this is mainly due to the fact that we're having a different perspective here. We're not, we're having the perspective of a, you know, kernel maintainer who is usually dealing with uh, long-term support uh, versions. And in that context, um, that kernel maintainer doesn't want the, um, the ABI to, you know, to change in an incompatible way um, across, you know, updates of a given um, LTS, I would say, main version. Um, so the idea is that we, that uh, maintainer or those maintainers want to see the changes that impact um, the, the kernel module interface, well, the, the, the interface exposed by the kernel to its modules, uh, want to see those uh, in changes in order to review them uh, to be sure he um, agrees, I mean, those changes are what uh, he intended, and uh, also to probably alert us automatically or semi-automatically about some changes that might be not um, acceptable. So we look at the binaries directly as opposed to looking at source code because by doing that, we capture not only, um, um, you know, um, what's um, carried by the source code, but also all the stuff that happens to the source code um, after you've written it. Like if you change, I don't know, the tool chain, that might impact uh, the source code. So if you just look at the source code, you might miss all those, you know, things. Um, so that's the perspective we're taking here. So without, you know, talking too much, I, I for those who don't know, I wanted to just you know show you how uh, you can be useful to maintainers in in you know very you know simple way. So I'm gonna drive you through an, a real world, well, a, a small example of uh, what we are showing today. So can you read this? If you can't, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, Is the site big enough? For you guys at the bottom? If it's not big enough, you can come. If it, okay. Oh, so it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but there is room, you know, in the front where we're not eating people yet. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, let's take a real example here of a tool that we have uh, that uses uh, the infrastructure we have today to compare two binaries, okay? These can be, I don't know, some kernel module or whatever. These are small. Uh, well, small binaries, and let's see what the changes to the interface uh, exposed by the, bi you know, the binary interface of, you know, this thing is. So basically, this is what the tool is going to show you, and I've just highlighted the stuff so that you can follow it uh, easily. So the first part is just a, 
um, an abstract of the changes that were detected. So basically, we we're seeing that there was uh, one function that changed. And so what does that mean? So <coughs> then goes on saying that the function that changed, uh, the name of the function that changed is function zero. Uh, it tells you uh, it, it's, it's, you know, its type and so on and so forth. And it says that the return type has changed um, from an integer to a, a char. The uh, type size has changed from 32 bit to 8 bits. Uh, the first parameter has changed as well. It was uh, the parameter has a type, uh, it's a pointer type. And what's ch changed is the, uh, the point tip to type, okay? Uh, it got a data member inserted at a certain uh, offset and it gives you, you know, the source um, line, you know? Um, and it says that the, the second parameter was removed from the function. So this is uh, the level of detail that we are having today from the current you know, infrastructure. Even though we're looking just at the binary, we're referring to the source code in the reports you know, to, so that we can be useful to, well, uh, normal people, okay? Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say is that we're looking at more than just ELF symbols. We're look, so obviously we're reading the debug information. We're building an, um, we're doing compiler stuff, basically. Uh, we're building an in-memory internal representation of, of what I would call ABI artifacts. So basically, we're building a graph of the functions, variables, their types. Um, um, that IR can be serialized to disk to save um, to, you know, a, a snapshot of what the ABI is, but that is just if needed. We can also compare the IRs because obviously we want to compare stuff, right? And the result of the comparison um, is not text. It's also an IR, an internal representation. That can be um, analyzed um, to decide whether the changes are worthwhile um, or just walking that IR to emit you know, change reports, basically. So, for the new debug info formats that are coming, I'm talking about, you know, CTF, BTF, or, you know, anything more. I don't know if there's anything more coming. People are talking about some compact dwarf uh, thing. But anyway, it will be very, so this is where the discussion, I would say, um, you know, starts or, um, um, it will be, very interesting that we could still do what we're doing, you know, what I showed, I've showed you in, you know, in the previous slides. Um, in, so what do we need for that? Basically, we would need a uh, full type descrip uh, description for, you know, uh, programmers levels artifact. By that I mean function, you know, things that are meaningful to programmers, so not um, elf section, you know, details and stuff like that. Nobody cares about those things. I'm talking about, you know, functions, variables, um, their types, whether the type is a structure, a pointer, you know, qualified type, things with const, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah, please. If I could just jump in here and just, of course, and just query can. whether you whether you mean only those that are visible in the elf symbol table or absolutely all of them, and whether you mean only top level types or even types that are only defined inside functions. I can't imagine you care about the latter, but you so might. yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, oh, yeah. So back when I was at Red Hat, I always took the most delight in um, changing the ABI. Whilst the stupid tool set I did. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things you can do to screw over people that the tool will not and cannot ever find, of course. Um, but um, but that's, that's absolutely true, uh, absolutely true right? Um, it's some kind of a mouse and cat uh, kind of. No, no, no there's a whole class of. of Changes you can, can do that are fundamentally impossible to, to, to uh, like 
uh, I'm talking about ABI kind of stuff. No, right? this is ABI. Yeah. So, for yeah. example, you have an object and it has uh, an initialization function and an uh, destruction function and some other functions to use it during the lifetime. You can change the rules. For, for example, some function might be optional and then make it mandatory in the yeah. This will never ever catch that. Um, you can reverse the order that two functions must be called. Yes. This will again never ever sure. find But this is not a structural. Uh, this is this is this is a matter of behavior. I know. So, so it's not. Yeah. To me, to, to me, to me, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean it, it's gonna be, it's, no, no, I mean, it's gonna be caught by other types of checking, like uh, anything that has to do with the behavior of a program can be caught by, you know, uh, dynamic testing, I mean, runtime testing. So this is not, um, uh, ortho I mean, this is not um, exclusive to, you know, um, runtime testing. I'm not saying that we should not do uh, runtime testing. We should do it. But the earlier you catch things, uh, the better, it, I mean, the easier it is to, to fix them. So this um, ABI thing we're doing is really to be able to catch things earlier, even before th those expensive uh, runtime stuff. So the thing you're talking about, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think these are not about the structure of um, of the entry points that are exposed by the binary. It's about the behavior, like right. the order of initialization and stuff like that. Yeah. That has to be caught by runtime testing. So uh, to get back to your question, um, the philosophy that we are uh, using today is the more I can get, the more information I can get, um, the better. And then afterwards, I will filter what I don't need. So you were talking about, for instance, uh, types that are, or, 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 or even functions that are not necessarily exposed, okay? Um, the thing is that, so let us, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to, to, to have examples. Um, when, yeah, you, you have a pattern that is used by everyone in you know, coding in C, when you want to hide um, um, the private, you know, data members of a structure. So the tr structure will have just one um, data member, which is going to be a pointer to the private, you know, structure itself. And that private st structure itself is going to be, like, defined in a uh, file, a .c file, you know, without header file. So it is supposedly uh, private, okay? And then... Um, the public type, the one with uh, just one data member that is a, a pointer, is going to be exposed in the header file. So I guess your question will be, do we care if there is a change in the private uh, part, for instance, of, of the type, the one that is, not, uh, that is supposed to be private? And uh, initially, I was uh, thinking that no, OK? And uh, we had like real, type, real life examples of people who, were, uh, who came to me and saying, uh, yeah, this is not an ABI change, but I still want to see the change because I didn't, it was a real uh, world case where just changing a define, you know, the value of a define macro was uh, changing <laughs> some stuff in the private, you know, section. And the define macro stuff couldn't be caught because, you know, of course, after the uh, pre-processing stage, boom, it's, it's gone and it's not captured in draw, right? And so what we did, and obviously we follow pointers during the analysis, right? So we were saying those things, but we were discarding them very early. So what we did is that, you know, we, we, we just give ourselves the possibility to see all those things, but then discard them at the user's will. Yeah, yeah, so good. So did I, I, I rip, rip. Like, like said, Yeah, so full type description of our function. So what do I mean by that? For instance, I mean that I would like to have the return types of the functions uh, described. Uh, for instance, that's something that you don't have in, the, in, in, in plain elf, you know? So um, it's, we would like to have like um, all the types of the parameter types but for instance, if the parameter type is a pointer, 
to another type, I would like to be able to walk through that pointer and discover you know, that other type. Uh, so not pack it and say, oh, pointer to type foo is a new type, pointer to type foo. No, I would like to have the ability to say it's a pointer to a type foo that exists and walk through that graph. And so um, this kind of thing. Um, very important. Um, it <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I see that we, some folks are in the know, um, yeah. So, deduplication of type descriptions. Uh, yeah, compiler people, you know, like using lingo. So, uh, I'll try to, to explain what that means. Um, so, basically, the way dwarf is, is uh, the dwarf pipeline processing is organized today, is that the compiler um, sees one um, compilation unit at a time, basically. I'm not talking about LTO kind of stuff, but uh, link time optimization. But at compile time, the compiler supposedly sees one compilation unit at a time. And so in that compilation unit, what it does is that it will emit uh, debug information for what it sees, okay, including all the header files that are included and so on and so forth. That is, that is emitted in a uh, locatable, okay, a, a .o file. And then it moves to the next file it compiles. And it does the same thing. So suppose for instance, yeah, please go ahead. Does it also emit um, structure information for structures that aren't actually used in that translation? Yes. Okay. If it is declared, declared, not necessarily defined, it's uh, supposed to be emitted. So, and it does the same thing for the next uh, compilation unit. So suppose that in the first uh, one, we had an integer type int uh, defined. We'll have an integer type defined in the second compilation unit as well, and the, in the third, and the fourth, et cetera, et cetera. So there is duplication of you know, types uh, definition in dwarf. And then what the linker does, is that it'll take all these uh, .o files, concatenate them, I mean, concatenate their debug info, their dwarf stuff, because the linker doesn't go and analyze what's inside the dwarf. It just takes it and concatenate everything <coughs> and sticks that in the final binary, you know, that is, uh, it is uh, uh, constructing. So in the end, in that final binary, you have int defined zillions of time. Uh, so it is duplicated. And you can imagine what you have for structures with pointers, that, you know, that, you know, points to types and blah, 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 blah. You have like a lot of uh, duplication. And so what we spend a lot of time at runtime in Libabigail, for instance, deduplicating those types, making sure that if you have two integers, I mean, you just keep one. <laughs> and if you have two types of the same name in the binary, and if they're the same, so there are, there are two conditions there. If you have two types that have the same name, and if they're the same type, so structurally, you have to compare their stru structure member-wise, then it's the same type. <laughs> so you drop uh, the second one, okay? So, so, and we do that across all the millions of type occurrences that you have in the binary. So it's, we spend a lot of time doing that. And so it will be extremely nice, <laughs> like extremely useful that uh, those new uh, debug info formats, you know, do that at emitting time, you know, when they emit the stuff. But this is quite challenging. So imagine, for instance, uh, <coughs> let's take an, uh, hypothetical example, something that will never happen in real life, probably, a kernel with modules. <laughs> uh, so you will have the kernel, for instance, with 3,000 something modules, each one defining its debug info, like, you know. So if you want to build the representation, an in-memory representation of that, you have the, that re representation must be the union, the union of the representation of VM Linux, the binary, hypothetical example, and uh, 
of all the 3,000 something modules in memory. And then, you, and then you deduplicate that. So I think that there is probably uh, some pre-processing, I'm um, some, sorry, some post-processing that should happen there. Because I think the compiler is gonna still see one compile unit at a time and probably you know, emit one module at a time, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it will be extremely useful to have that uh, thing done. Um, uh, I think that the BTF guys are talking about that in one of the, the blog posts I've seen from the Facebook guys talking about that. But um, I don't know what the state of things uh, with have, uh, CTF. Uh, I can specifically say that for uh, we have a new deduplicator being written, but for the old deduplicator with a, ke a, a kernel with 3,000 modules, um, it come, it, it, uh, at, the mo at the moment it takes about, well, before three weeks ago it took a minute and a half, sorry, before three weeks ago it took a minute and a half to emit um, about six meg of compressed CTF describing all of them. Uh, now it takes about 40 seconds to, uh, to emit about 5.5 meg describing all of them. Without that, without deduplication, you get 55 million types and hundreds of meg of repeated junk. Oh, so you really surprise. need deduplication. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you, you've got yeah. it. So. Yeah, exactly. And for instance, today, so Matthias is here. Uh, I don't know if you were to his uh, talk um, yesterday uh, where he was presenting you know, their... Um, um, process about ABI and stuff in, in uh, Android. Um, yeah, we, we've been working on this just to give you, a, you know, kind of uh, time, you know, scale. Uh, I think now on a regular laptop, we're down to, so to emit the entire ABI. So it's not just the deduplication. So you read the binaries, the oomph thousands binaries, uh, you do everything and you save it to in, on disk duplication included because we have to do it. So it's we're around uh, 100 and you know 20 seconds or something, right? I mean, for the full-blown kernel, uh, the Android guys are like faster because they do, you know, like <laughs> yeah, they take corners with uh, very high uh, so, velocity so or something. So it so takes <coughs> longer than to actually build a kernel. Um, I don't know how long it takes on the on not those not machines. One hundred and twenty seconds. I think it takes more th than it that to build a kernel. No? That's redundancy. Uh, uh, the, the Android kernel builds in that configuration that I'm testing in roughly two minutes, and the extraction of the ABI is roughly twenty seconds, fifteen seconds. It depends. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so we, we are using a lot of heuristics and so on and so forth to speed up that thing and, you know, a lot of you know, mental power. And it will be very, very useful to have that. So, yeah. If, well, if, yeah. I should point out that unlike Torf, with CTF, we are deduplicating at link in time, at link time. And we are in the process of putting that logic in Binutil 6 of the link. So at link time, but what about all those modules? Because you, you don't see... So, I mean, that's super nice already for VM Linux. They specialized, um, the, the, uh, the, m most of the type merging and deduplication stuff is in a library which Binutil um, um, uh, pr produces, and there is a specialized kernel side deduplicator, uh, uh, deduplicator which, which, which does a similar job on, the, on a kernel scale and knows what modules are and that sort of thing. Um, but okay, we, so we will okay. see that later in the. Yes, in okay, the that's, that's, that's that. yeah. So, I guess this is uh, my request for, you know, you fine fellows. Um, and if you don't have any more questions, thank you very much. We have like five minutes for questions, complaints. <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet. Can I just say Mid Abigail is awesome? <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so let's process to the next one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.
Come and be that one. This, this one is true gold. Ask questions. And this is gold. Yes, that's true. Okay. Is it all right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, can I be heard correctly? Can you hear me? Well, I can hear you, but that's not good for the mic. Yeah. Maybe you won't hear properly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. I'll just. Hey, hey, hey. I'll, ju yeah, I'll just check. Hey, hey. It's too low. Okay. So, my name is Maciej Rzecki. Welcome to this <laughs> presentation. Hey, 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 in GLIPC. <coughs> so, <coughs> so <coughs> I haven't been involved with in, in that myself, although I've been contributing to GLIPC and working with the community for you know, several years now. And uh, this will be essentially a message from Florian with a request for feedback uh, from all of you, if there's anything <laughs> done better or <laughs> suggestions, uh, then the, this will be taken into account and we'll carry the message to, to, to the call drum in Montreal, which is happening this coming uh, Thursday. So, the, the motivation 
for, for having the Cisco wrapped in, in, in uh, G legacy is uh, there are several advantages to, to that. R rather than doing raw uh, Cisco calls from, from uh, various applications which happen to, 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 to mm -hmm. have a need mm -hmm. for them. <laughs> Corresponding, there's no corresponding uh, C library interface. So one of them is type checking, which is, uh, I think, obvious. The other one is portability across Linux ports, uh, which means essentially you have a C interface where, where you um, uh, can invoke the syscall uh, as if a usual you know, C function and you don't need to... to Where's this coming from? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so, so essentially, yeah. So mm, uh, otherwise, obviously, all, uh, each of the applications which uh, wants to use the, the interface would have to know all the gory details of the, uh, the, the uh, unique calling convention for, for syscalls, uh, meaning generally writing assembly code and such stuff. Another thing is POSIX, POSIX script cancellation, which uh, which can uh, which will be done. Hey, hey. Yeah, it's working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just got interference in the mic, so sorry. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, and debugging the thing is essentially you can. You can place a break. You can place a breakpoint, or, or, or um, uh, at the uh, at the single entry point to 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 at the Cisco wrapper, rather than uh, having to chase all the all the um, Cisco inv invocations in in assembly. So uh, traditionally. All the syscalls used to be wrapped by, by C libraries, and uh, GLHC used to do that as well, but a historical mistake was made at one point that, uh, that we stopped doing that, and lesson has been learned, and, and we decided the, to, to, to do this again, essentially. So, uh, but this is only going to be for, for the syscalls that are actually useful for, to applications. We're not going to expose stuff like um, uh, some architectures require a syscall to, to set the thread pointer, for example, like x86 using the an LDT entry. This is used internally by GLHC, so if it was to be exposed to an application, then all things could break, so so we're not going to, to have that. Uh, but otherwise, the, there's no, no no problem to have the syscalls. We have uh, some guide guidelines prepared already. What's what's uh, what's the Cisco wrappers are supposed to, to, to look like, and why the intent is there to, to have them. We're not uh, regrettably going to add them all at once. The, the thing is essentially the, 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 there is significant effort to, to doing that and uh, each, each of the uh, functions have to be documented in the, in the, um, in the GLIPC manual and that has to be reviewed. You have the question? Is the copyright only for the documentation or also for the wrapper? Yes, it's 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 both for documentation and for code. So uh, does the FSF now acknowledge that there is copyright on APIs? It's it's not it's not about the API. <laughs> it's about the the, the 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 actual piece of code. I mean, there is know. no code. It's a wrapper. Uh, it's actually a piece of code. Well, but it it depends. As you say, if uh, a little piece of code is implementing an interface and there is no creativity required for writing it, meaning that you cannot do it in a different way, lexically speaking, Which then you use, the yes, yeah. then, and in, dif in other GNU packages and programs, we have files like uh, describing uh, font maps, for example, which will be something similar. 
where uh, we consider those files to not be copyrightable. But it will we will need to look at each case separately involving lawyers probably and so on. But yeah, not everything can be copyrighted. So. Yeah, and of course, you know, if 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 the contribution is very small, there, there's the rule that like if you contribute up to like 15 lines of code, you, it can, it can just go in. And if, if you say your 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 say your proposed wrapper is going to fit into that, that's not not going to be an issue. And these days, doing pro a copyright assignment with SF FSF is not that it's usually not a big deal because this can be done electronically for many people. So so. Uh, well, I'm not a lawyer, so I no, can't speak no, about me that. Neither. But I'm just I mean, you know, this, yes, but yeah, but <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if 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 it's uh, if it's void in in your country, for example, then you can do this and you know ignore that from then on. So you know, because it's not valid anyway. So you know, yeah, I mean, you know, that's but, but I you didn't say that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, you know, you, you that's that's that's. That, that's that, that's nothing illegal. You know, I mean, you know, if FSF requests that, you can do that, but it's not going to 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 to, you know, sort of uh, take your copyright away from you. That's that's uh, um, you know, essentially ineffective in your <coughs> for for your country. So, but uh, that's nothing. You can actually do it electronically yes, now? Yes, yes. I, I don't know the, the exact details where it applies, but uh, I believe it's, it's uh, for, for, year, for, for you know, private persons in the US and I believe in Germany and a couple of other countries. I think it, I, I think it was like two years ago or something because I needed to get some stuff into GLITC and uh, I, I think I still had to mail a letter <laughs> to the US or something. Oh. Germany. I have done copyright assignment to in Germany from Germany where I lived, and uh, you can do it with the PDF. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> okay, and 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 the final problem with with adding more wrappers is is essentially we. we 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 are short of uh, reviewers. That's the, the usual problem. We, we the the, the GLIPC community is not very large at, the, at at this time. Everyone is welcome to join us, of course. But with uh, the with the task force of people that we currently have, and so many things to do, uh, it it may be quite a stretch to 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 to, to do this as well, especially all at, at the time. So. So if, you know, all the contributions are welcome. Um, and ju uh, just in case people are um, put off by its past reputation, the Glipsy community is really inviting these days. It's one of the most pleasant co yes, com communities, yes, the communities yes. that are ever contributed to. Yeah, indeed. We, we, we are consensus driven uh, these days, so essentially, uh, for a change to be accepted, the, 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 there has to be no, no serious objections for people from, from, from the community and usually just a single uh, acknowledgement from one of the maintainers in, is enough to get the change in. Okay, so, so here are some specific notes uh, about um, uh, our GLIPC project's requirements for, for the um, Cisco wrappers. So we're not going to emulate uh, syscalls that have been removed, deprecated, or are not present for, for whatever reason. Uh, we're just going to return NOCs, uh, well, pass the NOCs uh, return status from the kernel. The reason for that is it's, except for very trivial uh, cases, it has proved very um, error prone <coughs> and, and uh, problematic. Uh, some trivial cases is our, where, for example, there's a new flag added to to to, to, um, to, to a syscall, which the, in in the absence of which we uh, an older syscall can be used directly. But but we 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 try to avoid that. Another uh, uh, another um, case is we want to have. Uh, 
architecture independent uh, names of the wrappers if at all possible. So essentially if, if there's a Cisco that's, that's shared across all the architectures, we want to have it named the same across them all because otherwise it's going to be a maintenance nightmare. Uh, a problem is are also uh, multiplexing syscalls. Uh, as I listed here, well, it's not possible to, to, to check the, the, the argument types uh, when they are different uh, for each of the uh, sub syscalls uh, passed through the multiplexer. Uh, if there's a variable number of arguments depending on the argument, uh, types or flags or something like that, then that's, that's also um, a problem. And one specific example Flo Florian has given is uh, the open or open AT Cisco, uh, which has gained the O underscore temp file flag at one point. And obviously if a wrapper didn't know this flag, uh, it wouldn't have passed the, the mode argument because it wouldn't know it, it, it's required there for, 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 for the, this new flag as well. And uh, some architectures have limitations in, uh, in, in that you can't call um, a variadic function which uh, has been declared with a non variadic prototype. So, uh, so we, we're not going to handle multiplexing syscalls uh, and we can make examples, uh, sorry, we can make exceptions for the existing examples like the Futex, but in this case, uh, this would be uh, by using individual wrappers for, for, for the individual requests. And another point is uh, it's preferable if a new syscall is added across all the architectures in a single kernel release because otherwise we, we were going to have issues by tr keeping track of which syscall has been added to, uh, at which release for each of the architectures. Uh, the matter of interfaces, the, there are some specific types that, that uh, we would like to see like S size underscore T or size underscore T for, for buffer sizes. This is mainly for, for documentation purposes so, the, so that we know what, what uh, the interpretation of the type is, even if the kernel uses int or unsigned int. Typically, well, the, the, the silentness of the type will, will reflect the, the, the type of the kernel. For example, um, the, the, uh, when the buffer size is, <laughs> is an incoming type, it will be unsigned, but in, in, uh, as a syscall return value, which can be negative uh, in, in the case of an error, it will be a signed type. Sorry, the, the, uh, about multiplexing it syscalls, calls. you, uh, well, I just want to be careful. Yeah. Um, about multiplexing syscalls, uh, that includes something like UTF, right, for example, it's a forever mess now, the mm -hmm. NTFU would need to expose them to expose the individual subcommands or whatever, Okay, so, so I just repeat that if, uh, for recording. So the question was uh, uh, about the B BPF syscall, which has the, uh, uh, which which has uh, which has a multiplex syscall, uh, and it does exist already. So yeah, so it will be handled by um, having individual wrappers for for all the individual requests. Yeah, so 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 back to the types. So. Uh, we want to have the long type avoided for, for flags because it's, uh, it's not possible to determine uh, whether the extra 32 bit, uh, the extra high 32 bits of the flags will ever be used or not on, on, on architectures which have them. For file offsets, the pointer to off 64 underscore T is fine. However, using the, the, the type directly is problematic because of the differences in how it's passed uh, across various architectures. Obviously, it can be in a single register or a pair of registers, and it's even more complex for, uh, as um, return value from, from a syscall. 
So yeah, errors have to be passed via Erno and a special return value. And we make an exception for, for, for the p-thread calls. And it's, uh, it would be very good if for each newly added syscall, all the um, associated types and constants were uh, wrapped into a um, separate Linux UAPI header because this way we can have support in glabc for all the uh, types and constants defined there by, by just uh, using the, uh, the headers from, from a kernel that's new enough to include that. We don't have to make any changes to, 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 to the headers that we already have. Just, just checking, presumably the important thing there is that it doesn't contain unrelated stuff and it doesn't contain function prototypes because they clash, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's the message essentially. Any questions or? Okay. Okay. Okay, I guess that's a no. I mean, who should do what now? So, because if we are, if in, in the libc side they are waiting, and in the kernel side you are waiting. Um, I think new syscalls are trickling in on the libc side. It's not fast, but it's happening. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. So, my question is: Is the current situation actually moving to some resolution or not? I, I'm happy to hear that wrappers are accepted or acceptable again, because yeah, they, this used to not be the case. Okay. Um, it might help if somebody would invest in, in enumerating which system calls are missing. Florian has done some of that. Okay. Yeah. He's, he's got a couple. I of suspect that. the first one is missing. Uh, that's the classic example of a harder time in a multiplex system. <laughs> I. <laughs> 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 it would be. Um, so, yeah. So, I had a separate question. Uh, can you envision how the kernel and the live C communities might better cooperate in the design of syscall APIs? So There's a mailing that list that for that. Things, well, I mean, there's a kernel <laughs> mailing list, but, but that, that sort of cooperation doesn't seem to be there. And we hear why a fora like this that. Yeah, we would prefer syscalls are defined this way or that way. And that tends not to get through to, to the kernel side. Well, that was that was think. Yeah, so let's try this one. Okay, so I think what what worked really nicely is uh, for some of the syscalls that were added over the, la over the last two kernel releases, uh, just CC, for example, either G like libc alpha directly or what I did is usually uh, Floyan. So if something goes really wrong, he will provide input. Like this has proved pretty valuable for uh, for clone, for example, the, the one that we did. So can, can we subtract Florian so then as an API? Is I think he is. Linux API still has a lot of unrelated traffic, uh, unrelated to this Cisco stuff. I mean, so it's quite easy to miss the miss the, the key emails among very interesting interkernel. So, so I think one of the things that uh, I kind of observed uh, is, for example, what types do you choose for uh, from the kernel side? Uh, 
might not be the same as what glibc is treating in terms of types. We had something something like this, but it also goes, for example, which I found out the hard way, <laughs> uh, for struct tests, for example. Uh, the way it is passed in the kernel such that we can do it uh, in the same way for all architectures. It doesn't matter if it's 64-bit, 32-bit, or alpha. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, exactly. Then talking to the glibc guys, and like, th these types are acceptable for us, but we need to provide wrappers and so on. If you have sizes in syscalls, use size t. Um, like for example, I, there is still sometimes a debate when new syscalls are added between uh, are you using an integer for a flag argument or an unsigned int mm -hmm. or a long or th that probably is stuff that could be sort of more standardized from from the kernel's perspective, I guess. Yeah. No, no, sure, but going forward yeah. for new ones, I mean, yeah. Sorry. And I have a question about, yeah. Yeah, I have a question about so uh, is there a, is glibc the place for um, like higher level wrappers around syscalls rather than just syscall wrappers? An example would be there's OpenI2 work I'm working on where um, the correct usage, actually, well, the most idiomatic usage of it would not be to just use OpenI2 directly, but instead would be to handle paths differently effectively. So you effectively would have like a wrapper around a file descriptor that you would then use as a handle to a file. The point I'm making is, um, is glibc the right place for that or should that be somewhere else? Which is something that I've been battling with. Or both. Or both, yeah. Well, my understanding is it's we only expect the bare wrappers with, without, with, without a higher level interface. I mean, you know, the higher level interface is at the sort of uh, the C library. Uh, level and you know that's that's mainly defined by the ISO C committee and and so it's, it's a such Exce good except stuff. of course that this is uh, uh, except of course that this is not tr always true. I mean, open Memstream et al were, were glibc first, and that's very much a wrapper around a file descriptor mm. implemented in Filestar and so on. Um, I think the real th th real question is probably that it needs lo a lot more design if it's going to get uh, careful design if it's going to go into into a higher level wrapper yeah, because other architectures and other operating systems might want to use it. That's true. Um, it might well may well end up going straight into POSIX eventually. Yeah. So if more care is needed, the more complicated yeah. the interface is, I would guess. I would just like to to add that sometimes. It's documentation that uh, uh, stops adding wrappers rather than a thin piece of code. Because, well, it, it has been said already that it requires copyright assignment. And some, sometimes it's not easy to write a new documentation when a piece of documentation on that syscall already exists and the author, author is not interested. He just contributed this uh, documentation along with the commit inside the commit message, for example, for this call, and he's not interested, and to write a new documentation for the same thing, it would require uh, either a new, a new piece of documentation, which is not easy, and you can't reuse the, the already existing documentation because it would require copyright assignment from that person, and he's not probably interested, or he's not aware of the thing, so it's like, it will require cooperation between people, and it's always not easy. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think it boils down to, to it boils down to, to 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 the lack of resources because obviously the GLIPC community can help with writing a piece of documentation, but <coughs> someone has actually to do that, and and uh, people m may not necessarily have the time to. to I mean, it's not that. easy to write from scratch a documentation for the same little thing, and not to to do a uh, right work. Yeah, but at least, you know, when you have a contributor, you can, you can talk to them and, and uh, sort of ask about the details in an informal way and get this mm -hmm. the, the, the formalized in, in this process. It, it's, it's, it's been happening before, so it's doable, certainly, but I mean, you know, the, the issue is the, the lack of resources. Right, I, I think GLIPC over the last two years at least, just from my observation, has changed a lot, like in terms also of how it operates. And it's, yeah. it, it, I think two or three years ago, we tried to get a patch and went for this TI, TI, TTI, yeah. PTP stuff. Um, and it, like, it took us over a year or something to get something. It was really frustrating. 
to the point where I, where Florian then wrote me a mail and said like, you should get a copyright assignment for FSF and then you can have comet rights and then you can push it yourself. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and uh, I think like that fortunately has changed, but the word needs to get out, I think. That is really a community that you can now work with. Um, yeah. I mean, we just got, uh, people are really surprised when we got the MFD uh, create syscall wrapper and the syscall tier idea syscall wrapper. I don't know how many years after these syscalls mm -hmm. were actually merged Just into the, the idea has been missing since Dolphin Right? Yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. ever expected that. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, yeah. But yeah, so I think if that gets, if that if word gets out and more people, more people know about this and th there is more, and there's even more interaction right now and I think between the kernel community and between the glibc community. And I think if we sort of increase that and kind of everyone who's working on the kernel side of things and then keeps in contact with the glibc guys, I think this will improve, uh, hopefully, so that we don't have to ship a libc library with LLVM. Okay, thank you for coming then, and 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 uh, we'll pass the message on to 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 the Jimmy Cruz Cordon early, later this week, and and uh, we'll do our best to to cooperate. So yeah, just as a, a small comment to a uh, question that was asked uh, earlier about how can we do to uh, better cooperate. Um, well, let's do this more often. Like, I agree. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, talking here, what, like before Cauldron, and you know, and so this is to me, this is awesome. Well, yeah, a lot of times it's. Uh, a lot of times, for example, it's uh, ask to ask ourselves, or this at least help me, is who has sort of a stake in this specific work or specific uh, system call, for example. And a lot of times it's glibc for not necessarily obvious reasons. And uh, But asking them for input, especially from, and you have to give it to him, it's like for, especially from Florian, is really helpful. Uh, and he's pretty willing to, uh, to ask really interesting questions um, that we uh, as kernel developers do not necessarily have on our radar because we might have a different perspective on things. Um, so that helps a lot. Just being also for the glibc community more, more active, especially on Linux API would probably help uh, a lot.
<laughs> Apparently, even being one chair so over. So, can you talk no to problem. me, please? <laughs> It's just amazing to watch you like ah. <laughs> seem to work. Hey. But Ooh. this one works. <laughs> yes. If you don't mind to use that. That's fine. You tell me when to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> you say yes or no. Yes. No. Okay. All right. I'll go. Hey, 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 hey. Ready? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Case. Uh, I, this was just a, an idea about um, trying to call attention to some of the uh, security features and, and like security flaw mitigation work that's in various compiler uh, tool chains now. Um, there's a lot of work happening uh, especially on the Clang side to get things up to speed for building Linux kernel. Um, and there's tons of work happening there and it's good, but I wanted to try to call attention and raise a priority of some uh, general security features. So what I mean, looking back at like old school security feature examples, stack canaries and uninitialized variables and format strings, like these are should be pretty familiar at this point. Um, these are well supported, um, although we do occasionally see bugs in, in various pieces of it, but these are sort of the, the things that were, I would call, were done with on the, on the tool chain side. Um, and this, this presentation is mainly these pieces, which I'm gonna go through um, in the following slides and get into what's missing and, and uh, what I'd really like to see. Um, there's a lot of like patches or plugins or half working things, um, uh, but I'm just gonna jump in. And you can download the slides too uh, from the first page. So I'm gonna start with the easy stuff, which was uh, per function sections. This works, um, it's good. Uh, I just wanted to call it out as, this is an easy one, it's done. <laughs> um, but this is mainly for uh, the reason I've been interested in it is that it supports fine grain uh, ASLR. Uh, so if you have a separate section for every function at kernel boot time, you can actually uh, randomize all of the functions. So suddenly you get extremely fine grain uh, ASLR of the entire kernel um, because you can just randomize the section locations, um, which is bizarre and wonderful. Um, one that we've been working on a whole bunch uh, lately is the switch case fall through. So in, in C's switch case, you can specify break but you don't specify fall through, you just leave out break. Uh, but that doesn't indicate if you meant to fall through or not. Um, so implicit fall through uh, was already in, in both tool chains, uh, but uh, Clang did not support the fall through attribute until very recently. And GCC actually parses the comments uh, looking for markings as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was to have GCC's parsing of that was to have parity with the IDEs and all sorts of other things prior to this being standardized. Um, and, and Clang has said quite loudly that they will not be parsing comments. <laughs> um, and the, the kernel is free of uh, implicit fall throughs at this point, uh, mostly thanks to uh, Gustavo's work. <laughs> um, and like in the roughly 500 patches just in the last year alone, about 10% of those warnings uh, were real bugs. Um, so it was actually a pretty high number of those uh, like actually actual missing breaks in the kernel. Um, so this has, has proven a, 
a good thing to turn on and a nice change to make in the kernel's uh, sort of C uh, dialect in that we don't want <coughs> to have implicit fall through anywhere anymore. Um, link top optimization, this is another one that uh, works in, in both tool chains. Um, it's required for control flow integrity because you need to have visibility across all of the functions simultaneously at one point. Um, there's kind of a lot of pain in updating the build systems to support LTO because you don't have, uh, you, you have intermediate states, you don't have actual object files as you build. Um, and there are still questions about the differences between C's memory model and the kernel's memory model. And there are some uh, worries that those don't match, uh, although no one has been able to provide a specific example. <laughs> Um, there's, an, there's an entire C standards document written mm -hmm. by Paul McKenney on this okay. issue. They do not match. Right. Oh, no, I agree. They don't match. Um, but no one has proven that using LTO suddenly produces the bugs, and no one can come up with an example of it. I don't disagree that theoretically there's a problem. Okay. But the practicality is sort of what matters here. Um, and being able to de declare a, a way to keep people happy about using LTO in the face of the differing memory models. Yeah, so There's I would still love something to be solved. Yeah, so I would love to sit around with some of the actual compiler people, and then preferably both GCC and LVM at the same time, and, and get this sorted out. Because right. if waiting for the C standard committee to get their hair untangled is just not gonna happen. <laughs> right. Um, I, I would like that too, it's coming up quickly. Um, that we're going to need to have this solved. The C standard committee in any way brings on the question of configuration. It's, it's not the creation of something, it's the, it's, it's the uh, The C standard's job is not to create the, uh, the thing that we should be using, it is it, it is to ratify what people what, what, what people already want to be happening. So you hope. I, I hope, <laughs> yes. I, I know some of the, the people involved too. And they have they have they have uh, told me that they have learned that lesson several times. <laughs> So th there is that, there's the end of life, there is, um, what's the other one? Uh, point, point of provenance, which is an absolutely disgusting thing. Um, there's the whole memory model thing. Um, the dependency ordering, the, there is uh, control dependencies, which C does not do. Um, what's the, there's a number of other things, but basically um, I'm scared of compilers. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, so anyway, there's work to be done, not in necessarily LTO itself, but in resolving the, the visibility and, and the memory model issues. Um, so st uh, stack probing was added uh, to GCC. Clang is still lacks this. Uh, this was as you use a VLA or alloc A, you'll actually read the stack in, in uh, small byte offsets to verify that you actually can get to that mapping. Um, from my perspective, this is now only interesting for user space because the kernel has completely eliminated the use of VLAs and alloc A. Um, and in the year that we took to do it, uh, system D had two exploitable alloc A uh, vulnerabilities. So it has been my strong recommendation that nobody use system. VLAs. What? To not use system D. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and say that. <laughs> but you can have a mic. <laughs> um, so again, this is another case of uh, effectively changing the dialect of the kernel uh, using the options that we've got. Um, but if you must use VLAs for some reason, uh, having stack clash protection turn on is nice. Um, then there's uh, Spectre v1 mitigation. Um, in Clang, this exists as uh, the speculative load hardening. 
Um, the performance impact is pretty high, but it's better than using LFENCE everywhere. And I think it's needed in GCP, GCC, but maybe I'm going to get corrected. Is it the heuristic that mostly works, or is it solid? Uh, my understanding is that it's solid, but that's why there's kind of a large performance hit. <laughs> if I could just note, um, stack flash protection isn't just needed for VLAs, although VLAs are an extreme case. It's needed for any function call with very large local variables. Uh, so you can't avoid it just by not calling allocate. You have to avoid it by, bind it by bounding the size of your local variables to be less than a page, which seems a little inconvenient for, for, for the general case. Stack clash protection well, is easier. Uh, yes, so <laughs> having large recursion, for example, you, you have an issue with that. Um, using this a is page less of an issue in the kernel. Uh, yeah, using a page worth of on-stack data is an absolute no-go in the kernel. That oh, just yeah. that this is a user space problem. Yeah. Basically. Right. In, in user space, it's still quite valid, which is why it's good to have it um, in, in all the tool chains. Um, so we don't recur this flaw again. Um, um, anyway, yeah, so uh, another note about the, the V1 mitigations is I believe in looking through this, there's an, a function attribute you can set. Uh, so you don't have to globally enable it. Um, you can globally enable it, but you can also do it on a, on a per function basis. Um, I still want to spend more time looking at this. Um, this is an interesting one that's in, uh, that's in the Clear Linux patches to GCC. So this is a patch only, but to an older GCC. Um, this doesn't appear to be uh, landing upstream, it would be nice. Uh, it's, there's nothing like it in Clang at all, but the idea is to wipe all of the callee saved registers on return, which has a surprisingly small performance impact uh, because XOR of, its, of the register itself gets pipelined away very, very uh, efficiently. Um, the idea here was this was designed to keep registers as clear as possible so they can't be used for leaking data in and out of all kinds of things for side channels and other stuff. Um, so to me, this was a, a low performance hit, easy thing to do, but it requires some internals at the architecture level uh, to enable. So I know we do register clearing on system code boundaries, but what exactly does this mitigate in kernel across every other function call? Um, I think we should ask Aryan <laughs> more specifically. Um, he was the one driving this change, uh, but it seemed like it seemed like a to me it seemed like a low cost way to just say now we don't have to worry about those registers anywhere. Yeah, so I'd, I'd love for some of these security features to actually have a proper description of what we're mitigating for. Right. I mean, it's low cost, but it's still a cost. I mean, yep. it's a death by a thousand cuts, and if it doesn't actually help anything, yeah. we really shouldn't be doing it. Well, the, the issue, the argument was, we end up with a lot of side channels through side effects um, and trying to control as many side effects and to bring as much of the, of the architecture into a known state uh, at a regular basis reduces w how much or where the leakage can happen even when we don't know where it's gonna show up next, which is sort of a weird you know, scattered approach to trying to solve it because we don't know what's coming next as we are beaten over the head with side channel after side channel problem. Um, but perhaps the, the poor justification is why it's not in upstream. <laughs> well, it would be maybe a concern for uh, unwritten functions, right? Because otherwise, you know, it would be like a compiler bug, basically. I mean, Calais safe register, they should be saved. And uh, the code generated by the compiler should be assuring you that. Well, no, this is, um, so if it's call saved, you don't have to do anything with it. You can just return and you can leave whatever state was in your registers. Yeah. The idea is just wipe everything that got touched in that function. Okay, just wipe the out the registers completely so there's nothing left over. And um, what's the status of that patch? Hmm. Clover. Clover, okay. Yeah. Sorry, yes, I should okay. rephrase that slightly. I was a bit confused. Sorry. <laughs> And what's the status of the patch? Has been it submitted to GCC patch? I, I couldn't find it anywhere. I couldn't find it submitted anywhere, um, and it's against an older, an older GCC. So I'm I'm not sure why it hasn't gone anywhere. 
okay, so we should do something about it if you want that in. Okay. Yeah. I'll go poke, poke Ari in some more. Um, so this is another C dialect um, desire in the kernel is to have uh, stack variables auto-initialized to zero. Um, we're most of the way technically in, in Clang uh, with this. Uh, there was a lot of debate over not wanting to support zeroing of stack variables uh, because it was viewed as a language fork because now you can depend on your stack variables if you don't initialize them as being zero. And this very much includes padding and holes. Correct. Um, that, and that works in, in Clang. Um, Linus has been pretty explicit about wanting it to be zeroed, not just un, not uninitialized. Um, so Clang's implementation right now adds a bit pattern instead of zeroing. Um, which is fine for avoiding uninitialized variables, but it's not great for how Linus sort of uh, views the future of that kind of thing. Um, there was a patch a couple of years ago from Florian that uh, didn't, didn't go anywhere. There were some conflicts over, well, do we no longer get an uninitialized variable warnings now? Um, so there was an idea of wanting to split Auto initialization from unused variable or uninitialized variable detection, and you know, still being able to warn about it even though it got zeroed, and, and there were complexities about that. Um, there's a plugin in the kernel that that uh, does the initialization, but it's um, pretty late in the in the compilation process, so it ends up doing some bizarre tricks uh, that confuse other things like ksan and and stuff like that. It'd be nicer to have this natively in the compiler happening at an earlier stage that it can be uh, correctly optimized um, throughout the you know throughout the process um, so yeah starting starting on this and finishing the, the getting the zero as, as an official thing in clang is uh, is pretty high on the list but at the very least we can do it uh, in the kernel and get stack initialization so clang has the pattern option so you know, I can, I can say, hey, if you're building with Clang and you turn this on, now you don't have any uninitialized variables on the stack. They are initialized. <laughs> they are not zeroed. So they have a, like an, the hex AA pattern in most of the bytes, depending on your architecture, the type that's there. Like it's an incredibly complex set of, uh, of things that they want to do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't understand. Um, and the kernel has a, a pretty large set of tests for this, looking for padding and, and other things. Uh, and so all of that gets initialized. Um, anyway, so getting this, I, I talked about this last year, trying to get a, a foothold on this. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, the, I think the main argument to just make sure it's up, up in front is like this does fork C. Like suddenly you do have like stack variables are zero if you don't do anything to them, uh, which is a pretty radical change. I suspect I suspect trivial specifically means doesn't don't expect this to work for C plus plus classes which aren't plain old data, or something like that. I I don't know, but I I'm pretty sure it does cover the C plus plus knowing the people who were involved in it, um, but I I won't I can't say for sure. I haven't looked at that. Um, a delightfully insane feature is the structure layout randomization. Um, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's for really paranoid builds. Uh, there's a GCC plugin that does this, um, and Clang has a, a stalled version of this that was done uh, as sort of a port of the GCC plugin. Uh, Good for that. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, it's just uh, an attribute on on structure definitions and. You get a randomized based on you know you can have a, a seed in your in your build tree. So if you build multiple times, you can have a static seed. But if you blow that away, you'll get a different layout of the structures that you've marked. Um, the plugin also has a, a mode where if it's if your structure contains only function pointers, it will uh, randomize those automatically, uh, which I think in the Clang port was a, a separate flag. Um, anyway, this isn't. Uh, in my view, needed, but it is really fun for paranoid builds because it changes 
the target layout uh, from the attacker's perspective. You know, why have kernel ASLR when you can have like code ASLR? <laughs> Does sl it does slow things down. I did some checking on a really old, old piece of hardware and it slowed it by about 5 to 7%, presumably because all the cache optimization and so on has been blown away. Yeah, so the, the plug-in, the way it was written, you can have a performance mode that doesn't randomize outside of a cache line, um, which is interesting, but it's still completely insane. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely feature. Uh, I could spin it as it's good for debugging. <laughs> <laughs> found some interesting problems with it. Um, so uh, signed overflow is technically an undefined behavior, but you can specify it being defined. We all specify it as being defined. It's yes. two complements, the yeah, end. Yeah. yeah, so in, in, the, in the kernel C dialect, we have defined this as just wrapping. Um, but it tends to be unexpected behavior. There are places where we wrap. Uh, I haven't found any intentional signed overflow outside of like the reference counter stuff, but um, almost always you don't want the result from your signed overflow. Um, this can be, you can actually uh, add the test for this. Uh, it, this works in both tool chains. Um, if you just sort of fail, it's, it's awesome. Like there's very little code size change, there's very little performance change because it's, uh, it's a flag test and that just disappears into the cycle counts. So it's in runtime wise, it's fine. Um, however, when you turn on actual warnings so you can get meaningful output, your object size increases like by 6% just from all of the strings that got added describing to you all the places where it, the your potential math has overflowed. Um, I'd really like to have this be a, a user-defined handler where we could have an explicit um, exception, like sort of like bug and warn use already, and then we can just say, oh, it happened over there, and we don't have to have a massive uh, text size change. Um, another piece is right now there's the die mode where, oh no, I, I, I've overflowed, kill everything. Um, which is not helpful, or warn and continue with whatever the bad value was, which has wrapped around. I'd really like to have a warn, but continue with a saturated value. Like, don't actually wrap, stop at, the, at, at a large, at int max, or whatever. Um, because most of the time, if you're passing it to an allocator, the allocator will f scream at you, and you'll actually get an error path, as opposed to getting really strange results. Um, very similarly, there is unsigned overflow. The kernel does a lot of uh, legitimate uh, unsigned overflow. So finding and marking those uh, is something that needs work in the kernel. Uh, on the toolchain side, uh, Clang has the ability to do this. The same instrumentation is assigned, but GCC does not. Um, I haven't looked into why. Uh, I assume it's relatively similar. Um, this one is not technically undefined behavior, uh, but it frequently leads to exploitable conditions and things that no one wanted. Um, so again, getting the saturated behavior would be nice um, because then we'll actually be able to catch the errors and continue uh, as opposed to getting small allocations that get overwritten, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna start with hopefully the easier of the two CFI types. So. Uh, Backward edge CFI, which is testing when you return that you are going somewhere you intended to go. Um, the hardware for support for this is, uh, is where most of the work uh, on this exists in the tool chains. Um, so on x86, there's the CET feature bit, and this basically just in the CPU becomes an implicit, uh, it, it happens implicitly on call and return, so there's actually no compiler support. Uh, you just need, um, kernel support, uh, OS support for it, uh, to set up the, the second stack, like you end up with two stacks. Um, on ARM64, uh, this works by uh, doing pointer signing, uh, but right now in Clang, there isn't an attribute to turn this off on a per function basis. You can only turn it off on a compilation unit basis, which is rather awkward. Uh, and there are special places where you want to turn this off like say all the code that initializes pointer signing. You 
don't want to have signed it because things go crazy. Um, there is a software implementation of the shadow stack. Uh, it's on ARM64 only in Clang. It did exist on x86, but had performance and other problems, so it was actually removed. Uh, so I, I think the thought is just waiting for hardware support there. Um, but it would be nice to have a software shadow stack in GCC as well, um, since it would be nice to use it in the kernel, but I know this would be useful in user space as well. Um, forward edge CFI, so protecting indirect calls. You know, you've saved a function pointer in, in the heap and you read it back and jump to it. Um, actually validating the destination of those uh, is another good one. So in hardware, we, there's really only support for, um, for coarse grain validating that you're entering a function. Um, so as an attacker, the attack service has been reduced from all of the bytes that are executable in, uh, to all of the entry, all the functions that you can reach, uh, which is a huge attack surface reduction, but tends not to actually be uh, practically uh, much protection because you can just chain functions. That's already what uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of attacks were doing anyway in, with ROP. Anyway, there's support for this. Um, the x86 and AMD64 versions of this already in, in both the tool chains. Um, in software, uh, to do this for fine grain, in other words, allowing an indirect function call to only call other functions of the same function prototype. Um, that's sort of the, the bucketizing that was done for fine grain CFI. This works in Clang. Uh, it would be really nice to get this for GCC as fine grain CFI really is uh, important for getting protections going forward. Um, the paper I linked here is sort of a one-click exploit generator because you can just automatically chain together all the gadgets you need to perform the attacks um, and CFI completely stops this uh, it, or rather makes the possibility so much smaller that uh, they at least can't be automated right now. Um, so anyway, since we have LTO uh, in GCC, it would be nice to also gain uh, the, the CFI features since we have the visibility available to, to do it. Uh, and that's my whole list, which I'll just go back up to as a reminder. Anyway, that's it. Those are the things I've been staring at and hoping to get help with. Any questions? Peter. <laughs> I'm lousy with ball. <laughs> um, one of the things that kind of occurred to me was, and I know already, every, you know, I know everyone is going to absolutely hate me for saying this, but once you're talking about like introducing integers with different with different semantics, because that's what you're asking for. You're starting, in, and then having customizable behavior for, diff, diff, for different kinds of overflow conditions. That's starting to sound an awful lot like something that would be a hell of a lot better done in C++. Because that is what C++ does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I I'm not sure it's much better in C++. I think is what I would say. Um, if you're talking about catching exceptions, eh, I still can't. Even with C++, like I can turn these on for C++, and I still can't saturate the value and carry on. Right? Yes, you can. You can define a class that does that, and that's the whole point. That, that, that ends up having a significantly larger performance impact. Um, this right now is a flag test. It's a single instruction. Yeah, you can, you it can, jumps you to can a do, cold section. Like you can do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it will be easier to fix these call sites up in the kernel than to switch to C++. <laughs> 
it, that wasn't there much. Yeah, in the meantime, <laughs> I have Rust modules loading. Yeah, Rust has been introduced, that's what it has in Rust. So, so except, except in, in the first chapter of the Rust book, it describes overflow behaviors, and if you don't, if you're not, if you're building in production and not on debug, it wraps. But, but Rust oh doesn't have a memory model, so it's useless. Oh, um, um, I'm, I'm not even going there. <laughs> I just, like. There, 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 there's a JavaScript add-in that says, like, yeah, if you do fluff, it will wrap the join join, but if you want it to be static, yeah. But it has atomicity yeah. issues, the, the um, condition bit and, and taking the exception. So really what we need is different integer types in hardware. Um, <laughs> so okay. <laughs> no. I mean. Is it, is it, is it has saturated add instructions? I didn't find them. Oh. Yeah, I don't think so. If it does, that would make things easier. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love it if we could just get rid of integer overflow class of bugs. That would be nice if I had a hardware integer type that would not do that. Anyway, um, keeping you from lunch or a break or something. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, this talk is going to be on um, client-built Linux, and it's essentially gonna be an update of the Linux kernel port uh, to Clang. Um, now, this is a, a project uh, I was a part of more uh, in the past. It's not something I'm directly working on anymore. Uh, however, um, Nick Desolliné from, from uh, Google uh, though the major contributor now and uh, the fellow that uh, basically is, is driving much of the rest of the work across the in industry, uh, he ha had uh, more important things to do this week and couldn't actually make uh, plumbers. He's at the Iron Maiden concert. concert. <laughs> so anyway, it's not that he doesn't love you all and doesn't want to be here. It's just that there's more important things going on. Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, in any case, so uh, what happened essentially was is that uh, uh, in order to do this conversation, this uh, talk, I basically uh, got a hold of Nick and uh, we got onto a Meet, a uh, Google Meet co conversation, and uh, he basically did a brain dump, and this is the result of that particular brain dump. Uh, now, the first thing, first, and this perhaps isn't entirely useful for, for everybody here, but just to make the uh, slide deck uh, come out is the first question we almost always get is, uh, you know, why use Clang, why bother? We've got a perfectly good compiler with GCC that we've always used. Uh, the kernel's brought up on it. It works perfectly well with that. Why would we possibly spend the time getting uh, Clang working? And uh, the major issue these days isn't what we used to say. In the past, it was because Clang had certain features that GCC didn't and so on. Uh, there's largely feature parity in many respects these days uh, to those, those uh, complaints. Uh, these days, the, the, the number one uh, reason is, is generally because some companies want to use a single compiler across their entire project uh, uh, set. Uh, and to a certain extent, uh, certain companies have decided they would prefer to go with Clang for various other reasons. Uh, over uh, GCC, and so when it comes to actually uh, extending and fixing problems, they want to do it with, uh, on a single compiler as opposed to two of them instead. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's very good uh, is that to a large degree, when it comes to things like the C standard, uh, most people uh, don't ever read the C standard, right? Just to show of hands, who here has actually read the C standard? Okay, that's actually a lot better than the last time I did this. Now, the next question is which version of the C standard? All of them. Okay, who's read all of them? Okay, so a lot fewer hands, right? Uh, the, the, the reality is, is the vast majority of people uh, think they know C. What they really know is write code, does the compiler say it's okay, yes, okay, continue. Okay, and even for those who have read the standard, have you read it all the way through or have you merely read parts that you need to read? And unfortunately, I'm in, I only read the parts that I need to read, right? So the reality is that the vast majority of us don't know C, and then beyond that, we don't actually use C in the, C, in the kernel project. In fact, we use uh, a, a version of C. We use the C variant, uh, sorry, the kernel variant of C. Uh, and so one of the nice things about using two compilers is because uh, standards are interpreted We just lost the audio. Yeah, I was pretty sure too. Um, it's, it's a good idea to have two different interpretations of that, that, uh, that spe uh, specification so that we can actually make sure that they match. 
So by having two compilers do the same work, in fact, we actually find those places that are otherwise considered to be undefined behavior. Because in the past, at least, from what I found when I did a lot of my work with Clang, uh, in fact, was that the kernel in certain, uh, certain situations was actually depending on undefined behavior uh, on different architectures. And so by having two compilers, we can actually find those things a lot more easily. Um, certainly a number of the, the areas where that's been a, a problem from a security perspective, cases actually uh, managed to find and, and get rid of. One of the big ones, of course, being uh, VLAs and, and uh, VLAs and structures. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in fact, uh, the work on getting Clang to work with the kernel uh, has had another effect, and that is, in fact, to improve uh, C support uh, in Clang. It turns out that uh, Clang is extremely heavily used uh, in both C++ and in Objective-C, and in those particular areas, it's very well uh, supported and uh, well tested. Uh, on the C side, it's, it's, in fact, less used than for those two languages. So, in fact, getting it to work with uh, the kernel being one of the largest uh, software projects in the world, in fact, has in fact uh, made it better overall. So, in fact, it's been a, a net benefit for the C pro uh, the client project as well, which is very useful. So, uh, this has probably got to be the biggest problem that uh, people brought up, uh, certainly towards the end of the time that I was doing on um, uh, on, on using Clang with the kernel, and that is uh, the support for Asm Goto wasn't uh, available uh, in Clang and uh, uh, Asm Goto is very important for uh, being able to enable things like config jump label, which allows you to um, optimize the use of uh, predictions of uh, fixed predictions of whether you're going to go of a particular what have you. Uh, Asm added to Clang and in fact has been tested very heavily with the Linux kernel. Uh, which is very helpful because, for instance, amongst other things, config jump, uh, jump label has now been made mandatory uh, in the x86 kernel. Uh, so it's something that was ac actually uh, absolutely required. Interesting thing, of course, that uh, Asm Goto, uh, though well tested with the kernel because of the, uh, the, the companies that are now using Asm Goto with their kernels, it's actually less well tested in user space. So for non-kernel, Target, in fact, uh, as I'm go to, go to, in fact, still is a work in progress in certain situations. Uh, oh, so many questions. I'm not sure the, the, the mic is on. So, yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> hug the mic. <laughs> yeah, we, we found a number of interesting compiler bugs. Um, while Asm go to was, oh no doubt, yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, it, compiler bugs are always fun. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's uh, this is one of those areas where it was a long time coming, and it was a, a long um, complaint that it was not uh, supplied. And in fact, uh, I was asked for this over several years as to when it would be added. So uh, it doesn't that does not surprise me. Uh, is is uh, inline assembly, and um, there's two levels. And uh, those two levels uh, are first, Clang needs to be able to uh, parse inline assembly, uh, whereas GCC largely is past the, uh, the assembly verbatim, so it doesn't understand it. Uh, because Clang has created a assembler, it actually has to understand uh, the, the, uh, any inline assembly before it passes it off to the, the, uh, the, the assembler, whether it is an external one or an internal one. And some of the formatting or, uh, that was used was specific to the GNU assembler. And uh, the problem was is that a lot of those things were uh, extensions and extensions that were not a part of any kind of standard. Uh, and in fact, they were often ex uh, extensions that even the uh, GNU assembler people basically didn't think that Clang should in fact implement because they were just too out there and basically unsupportable. The things that people were already using, they couldn't remove them themselves, but they sort of wish they hadn't done some of those things. Uh, as a result, support in Clang has been very difficult in areas. Uh, the nice thing is that the Herculean task of, of changing the assembly in the Linux kernel to be more standardized, a lot of that has been done now. So it depends on the architecture exactly. Um, for instance, uh, uh, Stefan Eigner has spent a long time uh, fixing up the, the uh, uh, assembly in, uh, in the ARM architecture. Uh, to bring it back to the unified syntax, which is very good. Um, 
And indeed, a lot of the extensions that were part of GAS have slowly been removed from the Linux kernel to make things a, a lot more supportable. So that's really good. Uh, unfortunately, the integrate assembler still can't be used, so the speed ups and the, the debugability that, that uh, the integrated assembler brings to the table, unfortunately, still aren't possible. Uh, however, that still is a, uh, something that people want to do going forward to be able to uh, make that work. And another question here. I think the. It should be on now. Yeah, okay. So the integrated assembler, does that um, mean that Clang can change our inline assembly? Or uh, does it guarantee that those exact instructions will be emitted? Um, the integrated assembler essentially is just another path within the compiler. It basically means that instead of forking out to an external assembler, it actually has an assembler built into the compiler itself. So the, the whole point is, is that it can, uh, for instance, in the event of inline assembly, um, just having a single instru instruction, it will just admit that single instruction continue. Okay, but it will not then um, interpret that instruction, put it in the intermediate representation, do optimization passes over it, and emit something else altogether, which has seemingly the same effect. I understand what you're saying. Um, as far as I understand it, it basically goes, uh, my understanding is it goes, it goes straight to an instruction. Uh, I don't believe it goes through that path. Okay, so because we, we very much rely on specific instructions to be emitted right. in a number of places. As, as far as I know, it, 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 I'd have to double check, but as far as I know, it emits an instruction. Uh, I can confirm, yes, if that's the case. It's a separate oh, path. There we go. And, uh, <laughs> the instruction will be preserved. Okay, yeah. excellent. The, 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 the comment was that it does parse the, the output so it understands the control flow that it, that it brings to the table. But, and, and yes, that's, that's agreed. Uh, the, the reality is, is, that, is that Clang uh, is supposed to understand uh, certainly the encoding and certainly what it's trying to do and so on, but it will it, it admit the instruction. However, at the moment, it's not possible to use it for various other reasons. Uh, it's just that uh, we're getting closer to being able to do that now, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, and, and basically, uh, the, the, the uh, support for understanding assembly is, is something that uh, is an ongoing affair and uh, certainly different encodings and output parameters and so on have been added to uh, Clang's support of inline assembly over the years. And uh, so that's taking us closer and closer to the point of being able to uh, enable the, the integrated assembler. Uh, the next one that uh, we should maybe talk about is LDD. Um, now, uh, the compiler itself, of course, is one thing when it comes to actually the support uh, surrounding the compiler, the rest of the tool chain, things like the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the linker, the debugger, the assembler. Um, uh, these, these things all come from bin utils traditionally. And uh, indeed, bin utils has been a big part of having to use Clang uh, still. Uh, of course, bin utils is a separate project from GCC. Uh, when it comes to Clang and LLVM, they have their own equivalent of, of all the bin utils, utilities. Uh, the big one that uh, people have really wanted to see for a while is something called LDD, which is the, the linker that came out of the LLVM project. Uh, now, this is actually kind of interesting uh, because um, one of the major things that LDD is very good at is things like LTO, for instance. Uh, and it does this in a very heavily threaded manner. So whereas LD and gold are quite linear because they're not threaded, uh, LDD is heavily threaded and therefore tends to actually get to a, an LTO output that much faster, or at least it, it tends to link faster, uh, especially in an incremental link, linkage situation. Uh, now, LDD has been something that's been very slow to be worked on over the years, in part because gold did most of what uh, it needed to be done. Um, however, again, there are certain companies that desperately want to move to something that is all uh, LLVM related, and uh, as a result, work has been put into LDD uh, to the point now where, in fact, there are uh, products that are getting ready to ship uh, later this year um, that are 100% LDD uh, linked. And one of those is uh, the next version, or very likely one of the next versions of the Pixel. I, I don't know which one, but apparently one of the Pixels uh, later this year will be shipped 100% with uh, LDD linked kernel. Uh, otherwise, sorry? It's LLD, oh, okay. yeah. It's also LLDB, which is the which is the debugger. 
Uh, unfortunately, the names are hard to say, and, and uh, it's like L, LVM and LLVM. People get those two mixed up as well. The uh, namespaces collide. Very. Sorry? <laughs> um, but yeah, otherwise LLD basically does uh, essentially what gold can do. It's just an entirely different uh, um, uh, code base and of course uh, a, different, a different license. And, the and, and sorry, what? Yeah, so we removed gold support from the kernel. That's true. I saw that recently. That's true. And why was that? I, I don't if I Be looked into that. Because we ran into various bugs and the bin utils people basically said linking the kernel is not a priority for us. So we said, well then you're not for us either. I don't have I, that. I hadn't heard that part, but I didn't see that's true. People had removed recently. So um, okay, well hopefully LLD can, can do similar things then. Uh, and now LLD, in fact, just being a generic uh, linker, in fact, it does not have to only be used with Clang. In fact, it works with GCC as well. Uh, but uh, of course, in this instance, the idea for Linux is uh, eventually to have it, uh, of course, compiled, uh, assembled, and linked all within the, uh, the tool chain. Uh, the next thing is adoption of Clang. And this is something that changes over time. Uh, now, the, the really interesting part was back when I was uh, doing this more heavily, um, and uh, I was, I was work, trying to work with Google uh, in order to get them on board to help port the, the kernel to, uh, to Clang. Uh, Clang was being relatively heavily used at the time for things like Android, and they were start, starting to look at it for things like Chrome OS, but on the kernel side, in fact, it was, uh, it was less interesting for, for many people. And uh, overall, their, their move forward has always been, in fact, towards Clang. And so in the last couple of years, one of the reasons why Nick got so involved in it was because essentially they wanted to move Android, Chrome OS, and other things 100% uh, to, uh, to Clang. And so generally speaking these days, Google has moved largely away from GCC and bin utils. And uh, to a large degree, uh, what they're finding is, is that there's a long tail of, of features that need to be fixed uh, in, uh, in things like Clang, in, I, uh, in the IA, and other things. Uh, in order to get feature parity, or, or for that matter, bug comparity, <laughs> with bin utils and GNU AS. And so, um, the first thing, of course, is talking about Android. Uh, Android, in fact, has lar had largely moved away from, from GCC to Clang uh, several years ago. Uh, getting it to work uh, for, on the kernel was one of the major last things they needed to do. And uh, these days, they've basically moved away from Clang almost 100%. Uh, the kernel was, was they do have a couple of things that still use GCC, but they use a very, very old version of GCC that they have instrumented to make work appropriately. Um, they're not planning to upgrade that. Uh, they they, they want to move over to using G, uh, Clang instead. Uh, Android Q these days, the, the one that just came out, uh, it mandates that their OEMs use Clang to build kernels. So basically, if you've got an Android Q device, in theory, its kernel is now compiled using Clang. Uh, the major reason for this is that they want to make sure that there's a 100% uh, guarantee that the ABI between user space, uh, Android, and the kernel is 100% the same. Uh, and so for d debugability and other reasons, um, they're, they're mandating that Clang must be used for all, all Android kernels now beyond Android Q. Uh, what this basically means is that all companies now uh, trying to support Android into the future, of course, will be mandated to use Clang for their kernels. Uh, to the end of being make, making sure that the ABI is in fact stable and in fact um, uh, basically works across all platforms. There are now people using something called libabigail that uh, allows uh, the, the testing of binary ABIs to make sure that the appropriate thing happens. Uh, they're basically trying to make sure that the ABI doesn't change over time or between versions of the kernel uh, or indeed uh, ideally between GCC and um, and Clang, but to the large degree, they're trying to make sure that the Clang ABI for their, their platform basically stays the same. To make this easier, uh, one of the things they've now done as well is they've shipped a new uh, dev platform. It's called Cuttleflitfish. It uh, works for x86-64, and it allows you to essentially do debugging um, on your, your, uh, your development device um, without having to go to real hardware. Uh, it's all 100% Clang uh, built as well, including the kernel, obviously. Uh, Chrome OS, same deal. They've moved 100% to, uh, to Clang. Uh, they now have uh, all targets, x86-64 and ARC64 are now uh, Clang built 
from the kernel uh, on, onto user space. Um, Air, uh, ARM32 still has a couple of issues that are trying to work through that they're not uh, entirely there yet. Uh, but uh, ARM32 being less of a, a platform for them these days, it's, it's been deprioritized is my understanding. Uh, but pretty much if you've got a Chrome OS device, it's, it's running a client-based kernel now. Uh, this one surprised me, and that is that uh, Google Cloud servers are in fact moving over to Clang as well. Uh, there had been a problem in the past uh, supporting KExec, and uh, that actually had, uh, had uh, uh, sorry, uh, stopped the, the moving of uh, services over to, to Clang. However, that's now been re uh, resolved, and they're now in the process of doing some pretty heavy testing to move the rest of uh, uh, the Google, Google Cloud services over to uh, using Clang-built kernels. Uh, just in general, my understanding is, is that uh, Google has actually managed to debug and find a number of fairly major errors by compiling with Clang in the past, which has led them to actually want to move everything over uh, to that otherwise. And I think we've got a question here. No, it was just a statement. Uh, yeah, this isn't just cloud servers. We're moving, trying to move all kernels. Sure. No, I'm, I, I, I can't say that. I, I'm just uh, passing on what was told to me. That, that no, my understanding I'm, is, is that I'm, everything I'm, I'm is. I'm adding to your slide. There you go. So th there you have it. So Google's trying to move everything over to, uh, to, uh, to Clang. That's more or less what I had understood. So but thank you for clarifying. Uh, the next thing is LTO. Now, uh, LTO is something that a number of people probably even in the room have been working very heavily on for years. Uh, LTO is now something that uh, uh, certainly uh, is being very used very heavily uh, within Google. Uh, the Pixel 3 apparently and newer will, will uh, mandate the use of LTO um, using Clang uh, and LLD as far as I know. Uh, Android Droid R uh, will be shipped also with LTO Clang kernel, which is uh, very interesting. So it didn't come out in queue, uh, but uh, will be coming out uh, in the next version. Um, and uh, the idea effectively is once they have that working that it, it will also be upstreamed to make sure that uh, in fact LTO support is, is pushed upstream. Uh, internally, they now have x86-64, ARM32, AARC-64, PowerPC32 and 64, and uh, last time I talked to Nick, they had just got MIPS32 working. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting to be able to have an LTO kernel uh, across all those architectures. And uh, my understanding is other, other work is being done in other areas aren't, uh, for instance, apparently um, uh, also messed around a bit with getting it working on Spark and System Z. Uh, not really sure how far I got on that, but apparently some work has been done there as well. As far as LTO support, uh, apparently they are going to support versions 4.4, 4.9, 4.19, and uh, standardized kernels that, uh, that Android currently, uh, currently mandates. Uh, as far as testing, uh, I, this was probably one of the things that I was happiest about when it happened because uh, it was something that, that uh, I hadn't quite managed to do myself and that is there's now a full CI build tester on both Travis but also within kernel CI, uh, which is quite nice, now using Clang, which is great. Uh, the other one that's kind of awesome is uh, the Zero Day Bot from um, Intel is now actually also supporting a Clang built kernel. Uh, however, at the moment it's private only for Google uh, in part because uh, it's still very noisy. It still has a lot of uh, warnings and other things in it that they're slowly working through, uh, but they're really hoping that they can make that more globally available uh, once they, uh, they reduce the noise on it. Uh, the last thing that everybody here wants to see is uh, a million errors and war warnings coming out from a compiler that they're not strictly using themselves at that point in time. Uh, so right now there's support for ARM and AR64 that's in testing, and uh, x86-64 is actually still a work in progress. Uh, so there's, there's still some work to be done there, but uh, the nice thing is, is that um, uh, there, there is more automated testing, even more so than what we were running uh, back when I was doing the project. Uh, of course, the other thing, that, which is both good and bad, is there are different warnings between the two compilers, as one would expect. Uh, this essentially can show potential problems uh, in understandings, fine behavior, and other things. Uh, this is one of those situations where different people have found uh, errors basically by trying different compilers to see uh, what the output happens to be. Uh, the testing in, in uh, the case of uh, Travis CI and, and kernel CI uh, is both building and booting of the kernel. So it's not just a build test like the zero day uh, bot. Uh, they're actually doing full boot testing as well to make sure that uh, the, the resulting kernels actually do something useful. 
Uh, this is this was actually uh, noticed the other day on on uh, on the uh, the kernel mailing. Um, they actually also added the, the Clang build Linux mailing list to the maintainers uh, file. Uh, if you look carefully, in fact, it's a uh, uh, instead of specifying a, a file, in fact, there's a, a pattern in there that basically says if the file contains the word Clang, uh, you know, message should be to the mailing list. So uh, basically, the Clang group has more or less uh, added themselves as maintainers for any uh, any file that claims that there's some sort of Clang aspect, which is interesting. So the good thing, effectively, is if there's a Clang-related uh, problem or a Clang-adjacent uh, issue, uh, the appropriate people will be uh, emailed, which is quite useful. Uh, so at the, at the moment, at least, um, the right people should be should be told if something doesn't work, or if indeed a uh, an update to a particular problematic pr uh, file, essentially uh, that's being made for GCC, they can basically see whether it's going to break Clang or not. So uh, this um, this list is by no means. Um, uh, this is not a list of every company that's using it. These are some of the major ones that Nick is currently uh, uh, aware of people using Clang heavily, certainly on the kernel side. And this is uh, companies like ARM, obviously Google, Intel, Linaro, Qualcomm, and Samsung. That's not that, that all the work that these companies are doing are on Clang. It's merely that each one of these companies is doing some work on Clang with the kernel. Uh, certainly, there are uh, people around that have been very heavily involved with it. Uh, people like Arndt and uh, Will Deakin and other people like that have been also uh, helping Case, of course. Other people have been um, uh, working towards the, these, uh, this work as well. Uh, the next thing is uh, it's worth noting that there's a public meeting every two weeks. Um, essentially, there's a, a Google Meet that happens uh, on a regular basis. There's a Google Calendar on the Clang Built Linux GitHub.io uh, website. Uh, that will tell you when those, those are, and uh, indeed, this is the the Google Meet uh, video chat that happens every two weeks. Uh, at that time, essentially, all the uh, appropriate people get on and talk. Welcome to be a part of that. Just what's going on? Uh, to a large degree, it's Nick telling what's happened for the last week. Uh, anyone who's been to the meeting, it's uh, basically rapid fire machine gun talking from Nick to everybody else, but. Uh, there's an awful lot of great information, and uh, um, it, it's a really good place to find out what's going on and, and what's, uh, what's important to the, the group of people that are there. Uh, there's also a, a list on the wiki of past talks. Now, these are primarily past talks that, uh, uh, that Nick has given over the years uh, on, this, on this topic. Um, I actually need to go in and add some of my talks and some of the other ones that people have done on here so we can have a complete history of everything. Um, but uh, there's all sorts of, of um, talks like this one that, uh, that are up there that can show you what's going on and what's happened in the past. And otherwise, uh, these, this is how you can get uh, more involved if you're interested in what's, what's going on. There's the major website. Yeah, I know, lots of, lots of URLs. Uh, there's the GitHub where the client built Linux code is actually stored. Uh, there's the wiki. Um, there's a, an issue list there that, uh, on GitHub that people maintain, uh, as well as the, the uh, mailing list and, of course, the IRC channel uh, on Freenode. Uh, now, all this information is available on the first link, so don't think you need to copy all these things down. Uh, this, uh, this talk, of course, will be uploaded appropriately to the, uh, the website as well as uh, the, uh, the wiki list of, of, um, of talks here that I showed you. Other than that, uh, are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, it does, uh, the CTF section does not get stripped out of binaries, unlike dwarf. It stays in there. Um, it's not a loaded section, but, it's, but, it be, but the idea is it can always be relied upon to be present. So compactness is very important. At the moment, it's about 2% the size of the debug info, uh, sorry, the, the, the dwarf debug info. This is before we have a work, and uh, before we have a working deduplicator, I expect it to be significantly smaller once there's a working deduplicator. And there are improvements we can make to shrink it, to shrink it further as well. Um, we have deduplicated the kernel with a previous deduplicator which reads dwarf and turns it into CTF. Uh, it gener the amount varies depending on the kernel configuration, but for our enterprise kernel with 3,000 modules of, uh, and thereabouts, it comes to about 5.5 to 6 meg. It was originally about 6.5 meg. With format improvements, I dropped that to 5 meg in just the, in just the last two weeks, uh, and I expect it to fall further. Um, this is compressed, so uncompressed it would be bigger, but not, an, not, not enormously bigger. It's much smaller than the dwarf would be. Um, I, I estimate ab about 100 meg or thereabouts down to... Okay? Okay. There is no support for anything but top-level ty top types at file scope and yeah. file scope types and variables. Things inside functions aren't supported. No, 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 also, also, also non-exported symbol. Right, so everything, right, everything. Simple. Yes, <laughs> but no, even, every, t every, every type which is declared at the top level, including things which are static, uh, gets gets pulled gets pulled in. Otherwise, it's not much use for debugging because the public stuff is going to refer to the prints of stuff which isn't public. Um, I, in general, I, I, I talk, uh, the libabigail people were saying we want everything. It's the same attitude for me. If I could ha do things inside functions, I would, but at the moment, I can't. More about that later. Um, most of this is done is a, is provided in a library, is implemented in a library in binutils, libctf. Um, there's a, there's a, there is some code in the linker in LD itself and in BFD, but that's only about a thousand lines. So adding to gold and so on is perfectly possible. I don't know about adding to clang because that leads into license hell. So it's kind of above my pay grade. Uh, I don't want libctf re-implemented. If I'd much rather have it be reused, but that requires like people thinking about licenses. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, there is a spec at the moment. It's only for the latest version of the CTF, but I plan to add everything else, including library, a uh, uh, library APIs, and turn them into man pages. It will land in bin utils. It's in tech info, um, and there's a link to the library itself as well. I thought I should compare it to things people might know about. Uh, Solaris CTF is notable for having been around for a very long time. It was the parent of all these other formats. Um, it's a, direct, it's a di direct descendant. I changed the magic number, I changed the section name because I've changed the format. Um, we, uh, we have more sections um, in uh, than, uh, than Solaris CTF. In particular, we have a section which maps strings, arbitrary names, uh, to, date, uh, uh, to types, which can be used for things like the kernel, uh, which has uh, where you don't get the, symbol, the, ver the data symbols from a, an L uh, L symbol table, but from somewhere else. Um, you could, we, we dig them out of chaos, proc chaos sims, and then you can use CTF to look up the name of that symbol and that sort of thing. Um, we have much higher li limits than Solaris CTF. Um, two to the 32 types, th um, to, uh, uh, the strip size can be, that can be that size as well. Two to the 25 struct union or enum members provided, which is way higher than the C standard allows. Uh, but it, but it, it's also much, uh, the problem is that existing things like the kernel can have very large structures and very large enums in them. We've seen enums with tens of thousands of members in there. Uh, we, we'd like to be able to represent them. So as long as I was raising the limits, let's raise them all the way. Um, there are a lot more type kinds. I was actually wrong there. There are 64 of which f four 14 are in use. So we can add new, new types of type fairly easily. Um, there's plenty of space for expansion. Um, we have uh, uh, bit fields in Solaris CTF were never quite properly designed. It supports float bit fields. If you've never heard of those, that's because they don't exist. But it doesn't support enum bit fields, which do exist. Um, we fixed, I fixed those with a new contraption called a slice, which sits on top of existing integral types and changes, the, and changes their, their width and, um, and offset. Does it normalize those any? Because, like, uh, do you have the ABI problem, or does it get rid of we the We are ABI going problem? to, these are all going to be <laughs> aggressively deduplicated. Uh, if you've got no, no, two no, 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 yeah. normalizing bit field order and things like that, because right now the C standard is wildly, well, it's, it's all well, we're uh, implementation defined. We are, we are, we are representing 
wh whatever, uh, because nothing is using bit fields at the moment, no consumers are using bit fields because they didn't work, um, we can more or less pick that arbitrarily. I don't know, uh, at the moment, because they don't work, we haven't been, we are more or less okay. doing whatever dwarf does, but I've agreed it's incredibly annoying, so it would be nice to do something else. <laughs> I mean, w w um, the um, from dwarf thing actually had to walk backwards in order, to, in, in order to get the bit fields in the right order. It was ridiculous. Uh, oh, and, we, oh, and we have a, um, a, a, as a minor thing, we have an archive format which you can use to take multiple C of these CTF dictionaries and slam them together. And we use, the, it's a, we use these to handle multiple translation units uh, if you've got multiple conflict types with conflicting definitions and so on. Most of them land in one giant dictionary, but the ones with conflicting definitions land in tiny dictionaries descended from the, from the, uh, from the, giant, from the giant one per, per translation unit. The parent-child relationship thing again, which is quite useful. Um, a BTF, I thought people m probably might have paid some attention to that as well. It's, there are a few more differences between BTF and CTF because BTF is derived from Stellaris CTF as well, clearly, but is, um, or is a cousin of it or something, but has simplified it and thrown out some of the things that we've kept. Um, CTF has parent-child relationships, so you can have a container, which, a dictionary which depends on another dictionary and inherits all the types from it and adds more. Um, and BTF doesn't have that. Um, B CTF has kept floats. BTF has obviously thrown them out because there aren't any in the kernel. Um, CTF doesn't have a function prototype type. We have a function. We have function pointer types, but BTF has a function prototype type in the, in the header file, uh, which includes a name for every parameter. This seems really useful, so I think I'm going to add that to CTF. Um, CTF can share string tables with the con containing elf object to shrink its internal string table. This can sometimes be quite a dramatic shrinkage. Obviously, BTF can't do that because the kernel doesn't have a string table, so there, so there was no point keeping it. Um, and CTF is older than BTF, but I think they're both changing pretty fast at this point. I, I started making, making major revisions to CTF about a year ago, uh, and I don't plan to stop. Um, I do have a backward compatibility promise. All old, CT, old CTF file formats will always be readable by libctf. I also hope, I'm talking about this at a later slide, to be able to read original Solaris CTF and BTF and write them all as well from, from libctf. So I'm not competing here. It's more that I can possibly pick up the CTF the compiler's generating and spit something out which is suitable for BTF if it fits within the range limits and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping I'm just strictly adding to the utility of the system here rather than trying to compete with people. So why not, why not just ignore all this completely and just use, B, just use BTF? The CTF is, has a wider scope. You, I don't think BTF is ever planned to be useful for user space, but I've got all sorts of ideas for CTF being used for C programs to introspect their own types, even if they're not in the kernel. It's got much wider range limits. I'm wondering, looking at the BTF range limits, which are the same as the Solaris ones, if, if the, no one's ever tried built a C BTF converting all the types in a full enterprise kernel, including all the modules, because I tried it with CTF, uh, with Solaris CTF, and there just isn't room. You run out, even if you deduplicate things. There's more than 65,000 types in there. Um, so at some point, BTF will need to expand its ranges. CTF already has, so I can probably give advice on how to do that. <laughs> Um, we will be able to omit BTF. I'm hoping we'll be able to translate in both directions. So you could pick it. So, so uh, I haven't designed the API for this yet, but the idea is that we can sort of act as a f universal translator in all directions for all of these types, with CTF always being able to handle a superset of all of them. This isn't really implemented yet, but it's a future goal. Um, GCC, GCC has um, recently gained BPF support, the next, uh, the next talk. And with CTF support as well, we'll be able to generate CTF for BPF programs and hopefully convert it into, BP into BTF uh, using the machinery I just mentioned. So again, this is still all being, all being written, um, or at least the conversion part. So what am, I what, 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 am I what am I planning to do with all of this? Well, for a start, if we, it, it would be nice to be able to, to use um, CTF in the kernel. But in order to do that, we'd need a version of libctf that would work in the kernel, or we might need one. And at the moment, it's purely user space. Um, we might, if it's going to be used in the kernel, it might. It seems likely it would often be useful in atomic context, panics, um, things like th anything running in interrupt context, anything running from a trap. So we'd like a version of libctf which did no memory allocation at all. Or, well, not of libctf as a whole, but of the read side. I don't think we're ever going to want to create CTF con uh, dictionaries from inside the kernel, and libctf can do both. Uh, creating a dictionary is much more complicated than, uh, uh, than reading one that's already present. 
Um, one other caveat I should have put on the slide on the Solaris front, if anyone's ever tried creating uh, dictionaries with, from Solaris libctf, it's terrifyingly slow. It, ec it gets exponentially slower the more you add to it. I, I, I fixed that a few months ago. It's not true of libctf. You can cre create containers and there's dictionaries and there's really, you can't see it in the profiles. Um, I want to be able to support big, big enum values. Um, BTF and, and CTF currently say int values, uh, enumerated values must fit within Q32. C doesn't say that, and you can have you can have uh, any into any integral type, so it could easily be, have a two to the sixty four minus one value, and the kernel has some. So I'm going to have to revamp to, to do a bit of a format change for that. LibCTF will, will of course keep its backward compatibility from us, so that so we will be able to read the old ones. C certainly says any integral, uh, and the kernel relies on it. So I better no, CTF no. a bit of handle it. I But you, can, you can certainly say um, two, to the, two to the thirty-two plus five ULL in, in, um, uh, in, a, in GCC in a CE num initializer, and it will work fine. So uh, it would be nice if I could represent that rather than just saying, "Oh, I'm going to ignore that enumerator type. No one enumerated value. No one's going to use it, right?" <laughs> um, we're going to. Pri I'm, I'm considering adding a section for kernel function symbols, much like the one for kernel data symbols, so that you can go from a name to a, a to, an, to a full prototype. Um, instead of just from an ELF symbol to a full prototype. But again, I only just thought of it, so that hasn't been designed at all. Why I'd like to support all of GNU-C, or at least more of GNU-C. The kernel uses vector extensions, which is something I only discovered recently, and there's no support for that in TTF yet. Um, I'm, I can't remember where, it's somewhere in the RAID code. Uh, it's got, it uses vector types on the, gl uh, the global and the static file scope. Um, I want to be able to translate in all directions. I want a battery, we want, I want a battery section but which is not really designed. So that's so I'm complaining of, we'd like to take from, take from everything dwarf and dwarf and orc. Um, I think orc has the opposite of a, uh, uh, um, I'd like it to be simpler than dwarf. No interpreters, thank you. We can just hope we can describe most things without needing uh, the complexity of expo locks. Um, we've, um, I'd like to be able to be oriented to online debugging, and I think I say in a couple of pages later, yes, that we, that we would like to be able to, that we almost have the opposite view of Orc. Orc, as I, as I understand it, is interested in uh, reducing, the, reducing complexity, even if it means increasing size, to, to reduce the complexity of the reader. I'm it's speed. Mm. It needs ah, to be right, fast. Oh, right, I'm interested yeah. in that as well. But I'm, uh, the, because I'm very much, I don't mind if the code is more complicated, as long as this format isn't well, well, complicated. There, there is this yeah. Finnish character mm. that has very specific views on complexity in the mm. unwinder. Well, I'm interested in reducing size here as well. Presumably the kernel's interested in reducing size because it's all, all in unswappable memory. It's not been a problem. Mm. Org mm. has been designed for speed and for simplicity. Because when you unwind, specifically in bug and in panics, everything's gone to shit. Yes, you d you d I, I certainly don't want the unwinder to require memory allocation, for example. That would be a disaster area in yeah, most so cases. Yeah, so ORC has, has worked really well for us. But I don't mind I don't mind a tangle of conditionals, for example. <laughs> um, but is it, but, I, I, but I would like to be able to take ideas from everybody on that because it hasn't really been designed for working on everything else instead. Um, on the format on, on the format side, I'm, I'd like to increase compactness. Boosting the range, boosting all the ranges, did reduce the compactness of the format a bit. Um, I, I know how to get all that, how to get all of that back and more. Um, for, exa for, for example, having a, having a, vi a variant um, which uh, which only supports really sp for specific types, which only supports small type IDs, which is okay because that uh, 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 because that means you've put heavily referenced types at low IDs, and then it means you can use a smaller representation for any type that references them. That's effectively the same concept as like JavaScript minify, right? Like well, except it would be done by the linker. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, we've already got overlapping representations, but the overlapping representations are for normal types and unbelievably gigantic types, and we should probably add ones for small types as well. Um, I'd like to be able to put. Uh, I've tried optimizing the string table, which is gigantic. It's often the biggest part of CTF, and it's really hard to CTF dictionaries, and it's, it's quite hard to compress. I tried to compress it by by splitting up at underscores and case changes uh, and turning identifiers into links to lots of, it, 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 and it was a great idea until you compressed it and then the compression dictionary was destroyed by all its variation and the size went up. 
Um, but what I can do, without, without adding any complex extra links anywhere, is to say that this individual, if a structure has a constant prefix on all its members, that we store that prefix once. And because there's no need to store a pointer to it, because if there's a, if there's a prefix there, we just use it, it seems to me that we'll be turning a sim symbols into zero, in, 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 into, into nothing, and would be almost certainly reduced size, for at least for things that have the standard of, uh, the old standard of, lo of constant prefix on every member of a structure. Um, it, it, it's fairly common. Uh, you yeah, see, it, yeah, yeah. Like C does it. Um, and yes, the historical reason is ridiculous, but but but, uh, but certainly some people like like it to make identify as graphable. I like to try to burrow as Wheeler compress as much as possible first to see if it's perform handleable in a sen sensible fashion. I'd like to try compressing with LZMA instead of just GZIP. Um, it seems like those are cheap ways to get piles of ex extra compactness with almost no almost no effort. It wouldn't improve memory usage, but it would at least make the, the, make the compressed format smaller. I want to get rid of our archives. It was an ad hoc format. It, it's, it's OK for gigantic use cases like the kernel, but for almost every other use case, it would be, it would be much more simple to just teach CTF what a translation unit is so that, you, um, so, so that you could have one dictionary with multiple types from different translation units in, which would mean they would magically share their string tables and so on and so forth, which would improve compactness more. So, so the parent-child relation of archives seem to make sense for modules. Oh yes, yeah, that's what we're currently doing. Um, the, uh, we have a container, a, a, a major di a dictionary with everything which is used by more than one module, and one dictionary per module. In, in fact, we shuffle things differently for the kernel than for everything else. For the kernel, things go in the in the per module if di dictionary if they're not if they're only used by one module. For almost everything else, we're saying if. And that all types, unless they're conflicting, go in the global go, go in the global dictionary, and only conflicting ones go in per, trans per translation unit dictionaries, simply because it's smaller, and it's m uh, and it's more likely the case that people will need most of the types. Um, for the kernel, often you only need the types in the core kernel and a couple of modules, and there's no point even loading the rest. But but this is all customizable. It's it's all implemented in this shared libctf linking machinery so you can write your own link like thing and uh, uh, and use whatever strategy you see you see fit and deduplicate across that interesting interestingly when you're deduplicating across uh, uh, squashing things into a one module per child has an interesting consequence what happens if two translation units in a single module define types in conflicting fashions what happens uh, uh, what happens if you have two translation units that define the straight same structure in a diff in different ways and a bunch of other translation units that just have opaque forwards to them. Um, that's a, a case the kernel does actually use, um, I, and I know how to solve it in the deduplicator, but I haven't actually implemented it yet. Um, you, you would, we would chase, if there's only one, and if it's, an, if it's a non-conflicting use, we would link them all up so all the forwards would turn into links to the, prop, to, the, to the real structure. If there are two conflicting definitions, one of them would be, consi would be considered canonical and would be lookable up when you looked at that structure by name. The other one would be hidden and would be only be visible where if you followed pointers specifically to that, to, to, to that structure. And we pick it to, so that the one that was most, had most pointers to it got made visible. I can't see another way to solve this problem. It's very rare. Um, and all the forwards in that case would just stay forwards because we don't know which one they're, refer they're referring to. Um, it helping, it yeah. might actually make sense to issue a warning. Oh, yeah, we, we, oh, I, and, might, and I might do that. But fix the, the we, we could put in, it's actually valid C, so. Well, I mean, it is, but I mean. It's, gru it's gruesome, it's gruesome, but it's valid C, so I want to be able to encode it without falling but, over. But at least. <laughs> Issue a warning so we can fix it. I, I mean, might, it is yes. a pretty shit situation. I might make it a warning that you can turn off and on so that we could be turned on with the debugging options or something. Because I don't, I don't like it like it when normal kernel builds spray warnings that no users care about. But yes, I, I, I agree that it would be nice to. We should probably warn about this. I mean, the Greenland is simple enough. Yeah. Um, well, and not if you're not if you're actually if you've got other things that that, that have forwards to it, uh, which might be passed to either of them. It might require a major rearchitecture. I, I I don't claim to. Uh, ah. It's don't don't it's we have it's a valid Cortinel use. for things like this? <laughs> I, I, we have, I have seen uses mostly in the old ISA uh, sound code. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm <laughs> who cares about the ISA <laughs> sound code, maybe? But I'm, yes. I'm happily unfamiliar <laughs> with that code. Uh, and the last bit, I noticed the sort of text size on this slide, this slide is still different, despite my attempts to attempt to try to fix it. Um, there are, I'm wonder, I was wondering what I could do which, which the kernel would find useful. In, in kernel associated stuff, Dwarves has code to read the old Solaris and FreeBSD CTF already. I would be quite happy to, once I've got um, 
uh, libctf reading everything to, re to submit a patch that has it using <laughs> libctf instead, so we could read everything, and it, it wouldn't be quite so much code to maintain. Um, I don't, I've been thinking about acting as a source of data for the kernel backtraces, uh, but this is a bit tricky because either either we ha need the in kernel the in kernel variant of libctf and all the ctf linked into the kernel and loaded, which uses more memory than people might say no to, or we'd need a user space helper that used libctf and you call down to it, which it would obviously you couldn't do in the case of panics because there's no time, the kernel, everything's dead. We do very frequent backtraces from NMI context. Oh, in that case, that pretty much destroys one of those options then in kernel. Then. <laughs> we do many, many backtraces from locked up. Mm. Um, in in backtraces no are, are important. In kernel, no malloc. Well, we would more, certainly. More mm. yeah. we, we would certainly be able to improve even without the backtrace section. We would certainly be able to improve the quality of backtraces uh, because you, uh, with the backtrace section, we, we, we could probably turn it from just function names into names and all the arguments and types, and, we, uh, and you could add something that would let it drill down through through them as well which is something that I don't think people had considered before now because it seemed completely ridiculous, but it would yeah. suddenly become easy. There is actually people working on some of that. Um, mm. Most specific for um, the function tracer. <coughs> mm. We already have the Fentry hook, and the, if you use the function draft tracer, we also do unspeakable things to the return. Um, that's the function tracer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, people were, were looking at having that print the function arguments and all that, and, and we've talked about doing it on backtraces as well, but mm. nobody ever. Well, but if, uh, yeah, so if we have the information, yeah. we could maybe do it. Yeah. Um, it's not something I've personally have had a need for. Mm. The option is there now, and it prob probably wouldn't yeah. be terribly difficult. To as as long as you have the, the, yeah. the type info for functions, yep. you can do it. Yep. Basically, we, we, all you we, need we've already got that. All I want to add is the parameter name. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, strictly speaking, all we need for a specific function is how many arguments it has. Oh, because and, and, yeah. and maybe a size. Yeah. It, dep it depends on the argument. I mean, I'm sure there are some functions that get past chars and things. <laughs> and uh, do you need? Do you do not need to know what is the kind of each argument so you can find it? You're not recording right, according to the ABI, the like uh, okay. But, uh, so I mean, if you know how many arguments it has, um, we already know what registers to look at because we have a mm. purely register-based um, mm. calling convention, at least on x86-64. It's, it's I mean, we do spill the stack, but I'm um, aware they are on the stack. Right? Uh, I just, yeah, but we, but we have a kernel function for that. We you just give it the number of arguments, and then the, the it goes find it goes mm. and find it. Depending on where you are in the function, that argument might have been overridden by the person who made the mistake. The stack. This is all but, you. But for Fentry, yes. it's it's still uh, there. For it, it, it gets difficult. Yes, yeah. I, was, I was thinking of full backtraces here, really, where, where you clearly need more, need more than just look at the current function, current range. Um, well, I showed you our motivation, a task of our motivation to work on this process. There are some people who could have used Atlas, but this is it. Who are interested in, who are interested in, in basically in a fast way um, to recover the original values passed to a given function whenever, it's, whenever possible. Without, without needing all the dwarf debug info. Because exactly, without having to implement a little stack machine, you know, so you can, uh, well, yeah. I, I, pref I prefer 2% or less to, 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 uh, of the size of the executable to 10 gig sort of thing. Microphone. One of the things that, that we're interested in is we would like to be able to, like, do post-mortem debugging without needing dwarf. Well, you, could, um, uh, um, you could certainly do that. With what exactly. You, what so, like now. for for backtraces and being able to get arguments, uh, that would be that is that would be key for us. Yes, we can't. We we obviously can't do info locals because we're not tracking that sort of thing. But uh, I think the goal of the backtrace section and all of this is to let BT work, which honestly, as far as I can tell, is ninety percent of what people do with the GDB anyway. If they most of the rest is runtime, and if you're messing about with breakpoints, then this is then you've presumably got all the debug info. <laughs> 
Is there any way to get any of like the argument attributes in there, like uh, or function attributes as well, like no return or non null? Because if you can get non null there, you, you can start. Thank you. I hadn't thought of any of that, and that's a good thing to go in the next format revision. Okay. Uh, uh, if you, can get that <laughs> you, you can make a backtrace that says this argument is null and it's not uh, supposed I, to be. Yeah, I should, we should definitely be adding be adding as many arguments as possible, uh, uh, attributes as possible. In most cases, I think it would basically be a bit a bit flag of some kind. Um, I mean, uh, in, no, it's, we've no, got the advantage no. that most functions don't have and most arguments don't have attributes, yeah. so it's not going to make things much um, uh, much larger. And most of them are single bit flags anyway. Um, I was wondering if we could use it to help the K and other people were wondering if we could use it to help the KABI checker in some way. I mean, the, my biggest problem here is that I tried to understand what the KABI checker is doing, and it, it just drove me mad. I mean, it, cle it clearly adding in most cases adding things doesn't break the K the ABI, except that I think it would change structure sizes and it would break the K ABI. <laughs> so if I understood what it was doing, maybe I could maybe so, I could. So on a personal K note, I'd like to it. abolish KABI and not make oh, yeah. anything there easier. <laughs> oh, I, I, oh, yeah. I, I prefer to make it but, harder uh, oh, yeah, to but preserve those, KBI. Those, those of us who have to deal with enterprise kernels have to deal with this monster and we'll have to deal with it no matter Well, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and when I was in a position, I kept telling people that. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's wrong on I'm, all levels. Oh, yeah, but I'm just trying to live in the world as it is in which people want the KBI checker, and I'd like not to have to slow the build down by masses to do, building all the dwarf and then scanning it. It should be something that could be done like that with this tiny view, tiny CDF thing, if possible. Because we do have the very, we do have very, all the variables. When I was in Red Hat in the RHEL team, what I suggested is for all the magic modules that we apparently support, get us the source code, stick it in the RHEL tree, and we'll just update it right along with all the other things. The problem, the problem, the problem there, the problem there is you that could have the, you, you I'm, have that. Yeah. Every time so the ABI changes incompatibly, incompatibly, which it does every few releases, uh, you have to go. You have to go screaming back to the people who would give uh, give me the patches, and I don't know how long you'd have to wait for them to, for them to come up with fixes. But <laughs> I mean, if it's all in the rel tree, all the magic modules, the the NVIDIA crap, the the file system monkeys from wherever, um, there is no K ABI. You just build new versions of it. Mm. Life will be so much oh, easier. Oh, I know. I, I, I know, but as long as we have a KBI checker, I'd like to make it faster to use. <laughs> and not so horrifying. Because, I mean, the, the one advantage of this is not just a format, it's a library. So you can just, you can just walk around these things with a couple of function calls. And I'm going, I'll certainly, if we, if, it, if we do get a kernel version, I'll keep the same API. Um, it, it's, it's and it, ideally, of course, anyone with binning tools would have access to this library once, the, once this all gets into it once this all lands and is released. The next released bin utils will have the library, but not the linker side, because that's still being reviewed. Um, so the, I've got some more idea, a link to an LWN article in which I completely monopolized the comment thread with more <laughs> API ideas and so on. Um, anyone who hasn't already read it, and probably everyone in this room reads LWN anyway, um, there's more stuff there. And I think we're now at, qu at, oh, at questions. I wish I knew how to stop it doing this. Let's go back to the end. Does anyone have any more things I could uh, I could use this for? Any more improvements? Well, so I'm going to want to use this because I've been using it for not just for a long time. Nice. Users, excellent. So, so I'm going to want to use this to generate Python bindings so that we don't have to write Python bindings in V ever again, right? Mm -hmm. So write a pure Python, uh, uh, write a Python module that then loads mm -hmm. these and generates bindings mm. dynamically as you try to, to use yep. something and then write Python bindings for to make things Pythonic in pure Python. So you never have malloc free mm -hmm. problems at all because these are just Python objects. Mm. Um, so that's really gonna help. So I don't have a question, I'm just saying I think we'll yeah. probably find some well, things that you're not expecting. <laughs> One of the first questions I got when this hit bin utils is will, it, will we support C++? And I have no theoretic, there is no format related reason why we can't have a CTF variant which looks the same to all users with, with, with extra API, obviously, which supports C++. It's just it would make my mind melt to design this. <laughs> um, some of the revisions to allow it to do sort of l large scale um, you know, reading and writing of different formats will also help with um, completely different la la languages like this. I've had people say, you know, you know, where's the spec? I wrote it on Friday. Um, where's, where's the spec? I want, to, I want to write a Rust version of this, that sort of thing. It's uh, the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. Um, the advantage, this is one of the reasons why I've got this format, read, write all the old versions thing, is simply that 
this means that other users, including other format interpreters, aren't n required to can't keep up with everything I'm doing. They can just feed it to me and say, hand back the latest version, or vice versa. I haven't yet figured out what happens if someone, ha someone take, takes some CTF with 10 million types in it and says, give me BTF. Or if someone takes some CTF, some CTF with an enum bit field and says, give me BTF. I think in the enum bit field case, we just drop that one type. But if there were just too many types, we'd have to say we can't convert this. <laughs> well, I, it would be an error code from the, uh, it's not a, this, these are all library APIs. So you, you get an error code back. It's just, this is just too big. Um, a possible future enhancement might be ways to split these things up in that case, but I'm not going to write this. <laughs> Because splitting type containers up is very hard because, of, because all the types can link to each other. You can easily end up with 10 times as many types and you still haven't shrunk the size of each any by any great degree. Oh, and so speed-wise, by the way, I thought people might want to know how fast deduplicators can be. Uh, the old dwarf to CTF deduplicator I wrote, it started out taking about one and a half minutes. Uh, after the recent speed-ups to libctf, it now takes about 40 seconds, and most of that is the overhead of reading all that dwarf in. <laughs> so I, I would hope, uh, you know, I've got a kernel, de and a non I've tried CTF generation with a non-deduplicating linker, and it spits out 55 million type horrifying CTF file, which is about 70 meg in size. Um, the fact that it only takes a few minutes just to do, to do something on that scale suggests that there's no fundamental speed problems in the, in the library anymore. I don't know how fast the deduplicator is, but as of last month, LD and GDB and all the rest of the stuff in BNU tools could, in theory, use threads. So, I, so I'm, I'm probably going to make it multi-threaded if need be to, th to, f to pull in CTF from multiple translation units at the same time or something like that in the future. And actually related to that, um, in GNU we very recently um, introduced a pthreads module in GNULIP, yeah, amazing. written by Bruno Heibel, who is uh, a monster. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, we are starting in GNU in general because this basically is giving us the ability to parallelize our programs in a way that, in a portable way. And as, as everything that Bruno does, you know, it's extremely portable. So that means oh Windows, God, yes. MinGB, whatever. <laughs> and probably Gold and even LD, maybe. But there is BFD there to deal with. But yeah. uh, we are starting, going to start to parallelize more. Suffice, yeah. to, suffice to say that I noted, I, I noted when I started working for a database company that I stopped working on databases. When I started contributing to GNU, I started having to use Windows because I was having to compile stuff on MinGW to make sure it worked there. So, <laughs> Bruno is a monster of portability. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so if, if, if people have more ideas, they are just, uh, the BNU tools list is where all this stuff is getting done. So if people have more ideas, do please come into the BNU tools list and offer suggestions. I will be generally happy to implement any of them. <laughs> and, uh, I, had, I hope this is of, of general use. Hell, in the future, in the distant future, I hope Clang learns to do this as well. It's just there are licensing problems, so I'm not even thinking about it at the moment. What, what licensing problems are there? Uh, at the moment, well, the license history of libctf is interesting. It started out, it started out weird proprietary. It turned to CDDL. It uh, from that it turned into UPL. Uh, uh, sorry, into a union of UPL and GPL v2 because we're linking, we're using it at the kernel side as well um, in the use in the build tools. It, once it moved into binutils, it became GPLv3 plus along with everything else in binutils. But I can say that I'm almost certain that we could turn it, we could turn it probably into LGPLv2 plus, v2 plus so the kernel could use it and so on and so forth. I'm fully sure that turning, turning it into, BS, into, into a BSD license so we could use it in Clang would be cause something that would cause people to scream. I don't know. I'm not saying one way or the other, and I'm not going near this because people will bite their head off almost no matter what I say. <laughs> uh, I, in fact, I, I, have, I have the gestures. So, so uh, I do not know. That all I know is the license has changed in the past. It may change in the future. I would like everyone to be able to use it, but copyright law so it tries, to stop, tries to stop that from happening. <laughs> I don't like code duplication, but at least we now have a spec. So if people do need to, du uh, to duplicate it, they can. I will add to the spec in future to list to provide differences between the current CTF and all the older versions so that you can easily tell, you know, sort of, what on earth is the difference between CTF v2 and CTF v3? A CTF v4 will be coming, and then I'll change the v3 to say what's different from that. 
And I'm probably also going to add something that says what's different between BTF and CTFV, whatever, just so they're all documented in one place. <laughs> I'm sick of researching this in dozens of source trees. Um, but that's all going to come in the next few weeks, probably. I'm finishing the documentation is very important. And the linker. Anyway, that's it, I think. Time by miles, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because this is important to start. Yeah. Uh, and also not like what follows <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I need to switch screens back without um, having to do some machine like last time. I'm going to need the cable, the VGA to the HDMI converter. And I have my screen. Now? Oh, she, oh. <laughs> down, down. Okay, we have uh, 20 minutes, so this is going to be fast. So this is about the eBPF support in the GNU toolchain. Basically, you can use you know, GCC, Binutils, and whatnot to generate your BPF programs. So first, I am not a tracing person, <laughs> all right? Uh, I think that I, I, I should mention this because... Um, I am just the compiler guy. Basically, you know, you give me some C source code and then I give you some hopefully very well compiled, you know, BPF uh, program. So, BPF trace, tracing, this, that. I actually don't care about it that much. I mean, I care about it because it's the main, you know, maybe the main consumers of this, but uh, I actually don't know that much about it. So, the project itself, uh, that we started a few months ago, basically the first phase, which is done, it was to add the BPF support to the toolchain itself. So we introduced a new GNU triplet, which is this BPF unknown none, um, in, uh, you know, in uh, BFD, DL headers in Binutils and whatnot. Then we made a first port of Binutils, meaning supporting the assembler of codes, this assembler, um, uh, and this was upstream already in May 2019. Of course, back in that, that first, those first versions, they contained a lot of errors, so we had to do some amendments there. We are not done yet with that. And then uh, yesterday, uh, the GCC uh, support got accepted upstream, and I did a commit yesterday, just in time. Yeah. But, <laughs> ooh. Um, so the first phase is done. The second phase is to make the BPF programs that GCC mm, compiles, um, suitable to be basically loaded and executed in by the kernel. Because one thing is to generate the BPF programs in an L file, something completely different is for those programs to be palatable you know, to the kernel itself. We shall see now that there are two aspects of this. First, you have a sort of IBI, uh, a sort of application binary interface, which is actually enforced by the kernel loaders which are the kernel components that basically get the L file that you provide with a program and loads it into the kernel, doing translating them into some syscalls or whatever. And then there is the kernel verifier, which basically determines what a BPF program can be run in the kernel in a safe way or not. If it is not, then it will not run it. That phase is uh, starting now, and uh, it is a continuous, obviously a continuous activity. 
all right, because the kernel verifier changes, it becomes more sophisticated with time, which basically translates into lifting some of the restrictions in BPF programs. And then, of course, we need to, to keep the compiler, um, uh, you know, up to date with that. Then the phase number three, which in actually is in parallel with the phase number two, is to also add additional components for the BPF developers. Because having an assembler and a compiler, obviously, it is, is very useful. But especially in targets like this, which is not that much different to em an embedded target, for example, um, the developers for that platform, they will benefit very much, you know, um, from things like a simulator. I will talk more about the simulator we are working on, which includes, you know, emulating some of the kernel contexts, you know, that uh, the BPF programs see. So, the port itself. Okay, BPF is very peculiar, all right? Especially for someone like me who comes, you know, from working on the Spark backend, for example, of the compiler, BPF is something completely different. At first sight, it looks like a pretty much harmless, little cute, you know, architecture, you know, with, I don't know, um, 11 64-bit registers, very uniform encoding for instructions, you know, arithmetic instructions, logical branches. It looks pretty harmless and nice, but trust me, it's not. Because uh, there are some uh, mm, characteristics of the instruction sets, there are some omissions there which come from, I don't know, uh, probably security concerns or the way the instruction set has been designed and, you know, and evolved, that makes compiling BPF um, challenging. Um, other than that, I'm not going to get in detail here. I'm going to do a, a big uh, talk in the cauldron later in this week, and I have a lot of uh, slides for that about the fun, and you know the fun and the interesting, how compiling BPF can make your life much more interesting and fun. But so if you are curious about it, I, you know, I forward you to the slides that will be published for, or the video or whatever. Anyway, other than that, uh, well, um, uh, some of the characteristics uh, are that first, um, kernel helpers, I decided to implement them as compiler built-ins. This is a slightly different that wo to what LLVM does. LLVM provides you to with a header file, the BPF helpers.h, and uh, Basically, it, it, it relies on some a specific behavior of LLVM when you build with minus O2 in a way that you, at the end, you get the instruction that you need to call a, a kernel helper. Okay, I think that that is very fragile, so I preferred to, um, to add, uh, you know, explicit uh, compiler, compiler built-ins that will generate always, it doesn't matter what optimization level you use, uh, it will generate the right instruction for you. This is much more robust, in my opinion. Of course, it comes as the cost, you know, that you have to, to, to maintain an explicit list of helpers. But then again, if you look at this, at this option here, uh, we also took the pains of adding to the compiler a minus M kernel option, which is similar to the minus M CPU option that you find in more conventional uh, targets. And basically, you can specify the version of the kernel uh, uh, where you intend to run your BPF program. And then, for example, GCC will tell you if you are trying to use a helper function that it does not exist in that kernel version. So this M kernel version thing, will that then also grow to include all the enterprise kernel versions that have random backports and God knows what? I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Awesome. Is, that is that necessary? actually work because in this in enterprises kernel distribution kernels we have a lot of things backported from newer kernel versions so we have 4.18 with the bpf at 5.0 level uh -huh. so how, how, okay. how does this work well for this first implementation i basically i'm using mainline uh, release numbers now you are telling me that in rel for example you have backports so this is not enough so then we yeah. should come with a solution for that yeah, yeah it's, basically, it's basically the, the old problem, not relying on versions, but on f features present. We could support both. I mean, or if, if relying on features makes this obsolete or not that useful, we can remove this, no problem. 
what would you do? Would you group the helpers, for example, in, in functionality or? I uh, mean, there is another option. Uh, I you, don't know. You, if you always use kernel latest, I, it I, will I, get any helper. Honestly, I think I that think uh, I think kernels. that hard coding BP helpers into GCC is not a, not a good solution because of back for the issues. It's not really practical. Okay, so you think that supporting this option is not uh, not practical. It's not practical because 4.0 people could use a little features. So sometimes you have a little version, you may do not have all the helpers. So all these yeah. could mix up. M my suggestion would be that um, is to move that header into the UAPI headers in the kernel and pick it up from there and specify the, um, you know, and, and that way if you need additional information about what's available in the kernel, you can also, um, uh, you, you we could we could also add um, pragmas to that to that header mm. file or whatever you know you you whatever you would prefer. But this is orthogonal to the to the header file. Mm. I mean, this is about because I know that in the LLVM uh, port uh, it is the BPF helpers header file that the basically determine which kernel helpers are available or not. But in GCC, it is the, co the existing compiler built-ins right, which are available but, but or not. But what I'm saying is you can, um, you know, you, you could get that information, you know, instead of M kernel, you could do, you could do that from a pragma in a header file. Okay, yeah. And that way it will, that way that pragma can be adjusted to match whatever district kernel, uh, district kernel does. It, it would be not really the version of the kernel, it would be the version of BPF that that kernel supports. Well, that I always try to, I mean, it's not always possible to do it, but as uh, from the perspective of the compiler, I always try to abstract the fact that the BPF program is going to be run in a kernel, for example. <laughs> right, um, but, so what, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but whatever options, you know, what, you know, we, we can encode that information in a kernel header file and give it to you in whatever format you want, which I'm assuming is, you know, pragmas. And, and that is a much better solution than putting it on the command line. Okay. Mm. The, uh, uh, there's really one here. Uh, an, uh, another alternative, um, given... Given that the set of the, it, that it, it seems like the set of backports could be variable on a per distro basis, and you can't turn that into a linear BPF version um, ascending BPF version number, is to, ha is, to, is to say that all of these versions correspond to a, f to, a, to, a, to a file which is a mapping somewhere under user lib GCC BPF or something, um, and, and, and the distro kernels could simply ship one of these files, and then all of a sudden 4.0 dash rel would work, and it would pick up the appropriate mappings from there. Um, and then you don't need to ship anything. And uh, this also means that new kernels could be easily supported by shipping one extra file without, without needing to ship a whole, extra whole new GCC. Um, okay. Well, we should discuss about it. Yes. It, it is basically what I was saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which basically brings me to the next point, which is the BPF helpers header file. Now. Um, at the moment, currently, the kernel is providing a BPF underscore helpers.h file, which is in the kernel tree, which, for several reasons, is LLVM specific, which makes full sense, because up to now, you know, I mean, LLVM was sort of a requirement to do this. Yes? Uh, I disagree with that. And, uh, with what? I mean, LLVM specific. Basically, the existing code has to be compiled with GC Cellular. So you cannot force users to abandon the uh, BPF underscore helpers is, yes. is LVM specific. Uh, you can have another one, but I think a kernel community will not like it. No, well, what I think it, w it should happen is to make it, is to change it so it also works with GCC. I mean, <laughs> the first thing that it has that is LLVM specific is that it includes uh, architecture dependent kernel headers. And that will not work with GCC. Uh, uh, another thing, another thing I, I think, uh, and you should just completely get rid of this kernel thing at all, and uh, 
the uh, whatever compiler generates the code, it should generally run all kernels, and it mm -hmm. shouldn't really compare. And whether a particular helper available or not, that's application developer's job. It's not really compiler's job. And uh, there, there may be some options, and we can have like a, a CPU generation version one, version two, or some arch architecture and the features. It could be added, but we shouldn't really care about the kernel version at all. I disagree with that. Yeah. I mean, because I try to apply exactly the same concepts and approaches and that, another, that we use in other architectures. Another thing about your compiler buildings, I think is also a bad idea. The reason is that basically means your uh, compiler, the GCC, is tied to a kernel version. That's a bad. That means the new kernel versions, old GCC won't work. How is that different to the compiler being uh, tied to some specific vector extensions or instructions and, uh, existing in an architecture. Yeah, to be honest, some people just have all the GCC. This yeah, but what is what is the difference? Can you please explain to me the difference? The, 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 the difference is uh, uh, the GCC, if you have this buildings and it is an old building, and then suddenly you get a new kernel, and it won't be able to issue helpers for the new one, because the new, new kernel version has new helpers, right? Well, actually, you you can. Unless I mean, you can generate a call constant, which is what you do with in, in BPF underscore helpers. No, I mean helpers, new helpers. For example, you have a package processing or chasing something. You said, okay, I know I have a BPF who chase SKB for some network and stuff. Only available in new new kernel, not older kernel. And yes. then you tie to a new kernel for GCC or this uh, helper support then you cannot compile for the new kernel. Um, well, um, we can add mechanisms to do that. Uh, the built -in, the compiler built-ins, I like the approach because, for example, it does, I don't know, like arguments checking, for example. So if you pass the wrong arguments to a compiler helper, it actually tells you at compile time. You don't have to wait for yeah, the kernel we, we to complain. Yeah, we can discuss offline about the best way to do that, but uh, uh, to fix the compile, uh, the Buildings in a comp compiler implementation at a particular <coughs> version is uh, basically won't work. Okay, I'm it cannot absolutely work. interested on your opinions yes. on that. And actually, you know, I think that it's about time that we have this kind of discussions yeah. Uh, online. Yeah. Um, well, the BPF helpers, dash helpers, not underscore helpers, dot h, that at the moment GCC is distributing, I want to get rid of it because I think that we can all use the same header in the kernel today. Or, uh, you know, I mean, it makes full sense. But for the moment, GCC has this BPF dash helpers instead of underscore helpers. Probably we will be able to work out, you know, some common ground here. Well, also, well, you have an option to specify in the endianets, exactly like the LLVM uh, does. And also, I had to introduce a new option here, which is to, to, to increase the limit on the frame size, which is limited by BPF. More about this later. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, um, one of the things I did was to try to support as much C as possible, but the BPF platform architecture is so restrictive that that's not always possible. I tried to do, for example, this is something that they would like to discuss with you as well, you know? I mean, how can we come, you know, with some general common mechanisms to do, to, to you know, to support a lock, a locker, for example, things like that. So, does it work? Yes. Um, those tests are all compiling tests. They are not run tests, all right? That will have to wait for the simulator. But, yeah, it's sort, you know, I think that the backend and the GCC maintainers, global maintainers, agreed with that. It looks like it's in a, in a good shape. So, first question I have for you. How should I call this thing? Because, you know, I mean, CBPF, okay, EBPF, and now what is the, wh what should I do? Should I call it EBPF or should I change everything to BPF? Uh, typically, we suggest BPF. BPF, okay, fine. So I, I think I did the right thing maybe instinctively since the beginning <laughs> because I'm using BPF in symbols, trip in the CTC, and, you know, an EBPF in document. Okay, I will change it in this. I think, you, I think you could call it CPF. It could make it even more polite. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Okay, then, um, I want to propose, I mean, this is something I'm actually a, a currently working on it. The name is not important. I, am, I don't care about the name. 
Um, I need a, a less restrictive version of BPF so I can test my compiler properly. And um, so uh, I thought about calling it, you know, XBPF or experimental BPF, but again, the name is not important, right? I, I, I am open to any name. Um, basically, uh, the fact is this, uh, this is a virtual architecture, right? So um, I need to be able, you know, to, um, to, to, to change the stack frame size so I can compile C functions, you know, like for example, a lot of local variables. Um, I need an indirect call instruction. I noticed that in LLVM you are actually generating one, um, um, uh, and I, I will use the, the same uh, encoding that you are using because why not? Also, um, in a BPF program, when a function call a calls another, it is possible for the Kali to access the stack frame of the caller, but only using absolute addressing. I mean, you cannot use the frame pointer of the Kali to access, you know, the, the, fra the, the, the stack frame of the caller. Um, in this XPPF, I plan to actually allow to uh, access the caller stack frame using the frame pointer in the Kali. Why? So I can support passing arguments on the stack so I can get rid of the limit of, of five words, you know, uh, passing as arguments to the functions. And also, also that will give me also the possibility of, uh, of uh, do uh, stack traces, right? Like a back trigger, which could be, I think, very useful for debugging your BPF program. Um, also, I want to assign, uh, assign division instruction. I want it. I mean, um, uh, also, you know, to avoid, because at the moment, uh, GCC generates a fun call if, if it sees that. So, basically, the idea is that you compile your, BP your BPF program as an XBPF program, and then you can go, you know, uh, go forward those, all those, uh, avoid those restrictions. What is the purpose of it? First, so I can compile, I can test my compiler properly. Because at the moment, um, I have to disable hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests in GCC because they use more than five arguments in functions because they have uh, the stack limitation, which is limited to 512 bytes by default, um, and so on. And that is bad for my testing because I understand that you cannot run those programs in the kernel, but I need to, tr to test my compiler. So we are basically negating the possibility to ourselves to, you know, to use our test suite only because of those limitations. Also, for, I, I said already, to debug your BPF program. So you can use, while debugging it, in a debugger, uh, back traces. Also, I think it will be interesting to have, you know, as a sandbox, you know, so you, you could experiment, you know, with lifting, you know, some of the restrictions in the future, maybe along with working the kernel verifier. And also, and I am very interested on this, on this last point, to explore a bit more to leverage ELF more, right? Because for example, in, in, our, in the GNU toolchain now, uh, LD knows about uh, BPF. It sort of links, um, but the, the BPF programs are very, very strange in the sense that they don't really correspond to the, no the ELF concepts like executable with a single entry point, uh, initializers, finalizers, because it uses a completely different model where you have several entry points and so on. Um, I think that having this XPPF think it could also allow us to play a bit, you know, and explore possibilities of leveraging ELF a bit more than it's used right now. And then it would be awesome, you know, if in LLVM you want to implement the same thing or something similar. So we can get, uh, we can agree, we can agree, you know, something like this. So uh, you can probably, I'm sure it will be useful for you also for running the LLVM test suite. Also, um, um, in my opinion, one of the reasons why of using a compiler is that you want the compiler, I mean, you want the errors, you know, to uh, as soon as possible in the development mm, process, right? And generally speaking, you don't want to have to wait until you do a syscall in the kernel, you know, to get the verifier rejecting your problem. Um, I know that the verifier is extremely sophisticated and it is getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, but I really want the compiler and also the simulator to do a similar job that the, the verifier is doing. 
but I definitely I don't want to replicate, you know, the logic of the kernel verifier there. So my question for you is, is there a way to um, somehow, you know, um, access or use or reuse the kernel verifier from user land, from user space? Maybe a program, maybe a library, I don't know. Um, Currently, there are some uh, BPF or fuzzy work actually take the verifier to the user space, and but it's really a pain to maintain that. Yeah. And whenever yeah. uh, the verifier changes and uh, fuzzy or some kind of the interface changes, they need to add or remove some kind of, kind of like because they need to simulate all this K malloc, K three ID or stuff, some other stuff. So it's uh, it's really so they. Typically, people do once a while, like uh, every three or four, six months. They do one a while. Some people and they run it and make changes to test the verifier. Mm -hmm. We don't do it very often. But it's, is this something you would like to have in LLVM as well? Uh, I think that is not scalable, this approach. So where take a verifier uh, changes so often and uh, it's not a scalable approach. And do you can you think on some other alternative approach that will uh, allow us to do this? Yeah, I, 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 I don't have. I okay, we can think about we can think about it. Yeah. I just I, I just I just thought of something recent. Um, I, I uh, absolutely sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the same problem the the vice three uh, are having. Is is leave FTD? I exact have no idea about that. Uh, it's exactly the same. There's something called leave FTD, which is how to handle a device tree. And it's it's inside the kernel, and it's also a library. So, uh, no, I think no, I'm not completely sure, uh, but uh, it's it's the same. So, uh, it's also used by the kernel tree. So maybe you can take a look of what they are doing and I do will. the same. Yeah. It's called the FD, 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 FDT. FDT. File tree, file, file device tree. Yes, FDT. I will. Thank thanks for the suggestion. I, I, I just got a completely gruesome idea. Uh, which is you, uh, li leave reducible to Linux. Um, if you if you could so if, if you could add add some way to call into the verifier directly, to, for, uh, uh, which is only available to UML, uh, 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 only u uh, available to UML, you could, you could compile UML and, in, uh, and, uh, and well, invoke the verifier. Before doing that, I will just do the syscall and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and check for the error message. Yeah, the problem with that it doesn't tell me what happened. It just tells me that the program is in, in, is not valid. Okay, the ABI. Okay, so the kernel verifier is about if a program is secure enough or safe enough to be executed in the kernel context. And then on the other side, in compiled BPF, basically is what constitutes a valid ELF BPF program, right? At the moment, um, this is defined by what uh, the LLVM backend produces and what the kernel loaders, you know, this BPF lib. Is it BPF lib or lib BPF? I always get so confused about that. And BPF load uh, dot C which is a sample that is around in the kernel sources. Um, um, okay, I mean, I'm not criticizing it because I think it's normal, right? Because uh, that's the only implementation right now. But I really think, and I would really appreciate uh, if we could have some uh, um, sort of common place where we could uh, document, document that stuff in the future. So um, it would be nice and we have to get in touch, I think. And then, related to that, um, well, now there is LLVM, now there is also GCC. The kernel is the consuming for now, but there could be also simulators and whatnot. And also, I think the trace has been uh, changed to, to, it has a compiler as well, because it compiles from uh, a language, the D language. And I, I heard in the yesterday in the BPF trace uh, session that they also want to start generating BPF, compiled BPFs as well themselves. Um, so I think we, do we need to coordinate somehow uh, for two reasons. One, because we, me particularly, as the maintainer of the BPF support in GCC and Binutil, I need to be in the loop. I mean, uh, because I can run after you, but uh, it, that's not going to work very well. Um, and also, um, we would like, we want to, to, to also to contribute this, right? So, um, for example, I don't know, uh, this new addition of the of the of the core uh, core 
I don't know how you pronounce it, this compile once run everywhere, which is very interesting, by the way. Um, okay, that involves adding new relocations, for example. So it would be nice if we could have uh, mailing lists from whatever where we could, you know, hey, what about adding this relocation of this type, this number, and, uh, and, uh, and handle it this way, right? And then we can talk about it and maybe publish it somewhere. I don't care where that could be. It could be in the BPF mailing list uh, or in the kernel or I don't know. I don't care. But it will be very nice. And that was it. We are already 10 minutes late. Questions? No? Yes? Thank you. Um, so what, how about uh, BTF? Uh, because you were talking about you know, debugging and so on and so forth. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, BTF is more important for GCC than uh, you may think because, uh, again, GCC does not sup it doesn't have an integrated assembler like the LLVM does, even though the LLVM integrated assembler doesn't work for every case. <laughs> I have to say that too. So, um, but so uh, for us, it's a need, uh, you know, this compile ones run everywhere for us is a fundamental need. It's not only, you know, that a nicety. Um, so, of course, we need to generate BTF or uh, something equivalent. Now, my understanding is that the idea is to generate BTF for the kernel and then generate header files from the BTF, right? As far as I understood. Um, so yes, now one of the next steps in GCC, which is something I want to discuss in the cauldron with the other GCC maintainers, is that uh, what how can we generate BTF? Because now we are in the process of adding CTF generation in the kernel. So in the kernel in GCC. So <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if uh, if we will gen generate CTF and then translate from CTF to BTF, and so we can use the kernel script, whatever it is that will translate from BTF to header files or generate BTF directly, which also has some complications because uh, in the compiler, well, you know about that, they try to use DORF internally as the canonical debugging format and generate everything else from it. It has to be discussed. But of course, we need to generate BTF or CTF or something equivalent for sure. Yeah, so we need to generate it and we also need to be able to read it and manipulate it. So um, th this is a kind of a shout out to whoever is uh, involved with that um, because, okay, I, it seems to me that, uh, so BTF is getting into the kernel, right? So that's a fact, right? Um, and so people need to read it, I, I guess. When I say people, the kernel first, right? Needs to be able to read it and do stuff with it. Would it be uh, reasonable to ask that uh, the facilities to read it be designed or I don't know as a library um, reusable which something. Translated as noted, libctf will gain the ability to both read and write. Sorry, oh, oh. the library or as, as noted, lib 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 yes. Uh, and as no, uh, as noted, uh, although although actually reading the BTF will require allocation, I see no reason why the no malloc version of the CTF I was talking about wouldn't be able to to do to uh, feed you BTF from C from CTF on the fly, as long as we're not, you're not going to comment conflict when you open it. Why would you be in a comment conflict when you open it? <laughs> so yes, I, I certainly hope you can help with that. Uh, yeah, well, what I mentioned is uh, uh, today the library for the lib BTF already available. There's an API to try to use the BTF and uh, basically to load the BTF and to listen and to read the uh, BTF out of the thing. And uh, can it uh, be ESP? ESP yeah, yeah, okay. So it can read, I mean, that um, BTF from any else well, uh, you binary. Can, I mean, like I can. Like yeah, you can you can read the BTF from the file and just play that and load the thing, or you can use the BTF from the. Thank you. And, it, and if you want to be able to pull it out of an RPC else section, I'm sure I can find a way to leverage the CTF's ability to do that with CTF. And to connect, connect it with the BTF thing in some way, we'll find some way to work together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are super late, and I am also closing the Tunchen <coughs> micro conference. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the presenters, and you know, because it was nice to have you in the. And
and I hope it has been useful, and I hope we have, you know, from the notes and everything, that we move forward in several areas today. So thank you. Thank you.